It's a pleasure to welcome you all to this celebration. My name is Eduardo Brondizio, Professor of Anthropology and long-term faculty member here at the Austrian Workshop. Welcome and thank you all for joining the celebration of the 30th anniversary of Eleanor Ostrom governing the commons, and more broadly, the legacy of Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom. Thanks to the organizing team, particularly staff Alison Sturgeon, David Price, and Emily Castle, and all the speakers and panelists for making this possible. We also thank the International Association for the Study of the Commons as we celebrate together the World Commons Week, an amazing lineup of, of events uh, that is going from yesterday to next week. This event is as much a celebration of one of the most influential scholars in book of our generation, but an opportunity to reflect on the collective social dilemmas of inequality, environmental and climate change, writ large by the COVID pandemic. As noted by one of our keynote speakers when we talk about the event, Bonnie McKay, in front of us are the underlying puzzles of governing the commons. Interdependence and non-cooperation, trust and free riding, complexities and uncertainties, and the danger of simple policy prescription. Beyond governing the commons, this event celebrates the larger research program of the Austrians and an immense community that they inspired, as represented in the panels of socio-ecological systems, polycentricity, new commons, and justice. We also recognize the work that Lean and colleagues did in the 1970s on the provisioning of metropolitan public goods, in particular policing, work that more than ever resonates with today's situation in the US and elsewhere. However, much is left out as a single short event cannot do justice to this immense scholarly legacy in an amazing community of collaborators, researchers, and practitioners. As we look at the impact of governing the commons during the past 30 years, these panels, keynotes and panels, will do so with attention to the present and the future. We are at a unique intersection as we look to an even steeper challenge of the coming decade, while yet overwhelmed by the complexity of problems and political cacophony laid bare by the pandemic. More than the theoretical and analytical tools, the design principles offered by governing the commons, it provides a sense of optimism to confront these challenges going forward. The world today makes one clearly appreciate what Ling and Vincent, and Vincent frequently noted. We are very failable people, but it's possible to cooperate. So it's also a celebration of their critical optimism, one that is welcome in this particular moment in this country and globally. While there's not a lot to celebrate on issues such as environment, climate, and overcoming inequalities, let's keep in mind that there has been also been progress on addressing many common issues. Local actors and communities, group efforts at multiple levels have been the main protagonists of much of this advance. As Lin writes in 1990, Examples of self-organized enterprise abound. Yes, they continue to abound today. Now, however, we have put so much pressure on natural commons and people that we have crossed what I would call a threshold of commons interdependence at all levels. We are running out of frontiers in the pollution and exploitation of resources and people and their unequal burdens we've seen in across nations are compounding from global to local levels. Lean in governing the commons describes this predicament evocatively at a very local level, quoting, the key fact of life for co-appropriators is that they are tied together in a lattice of interdependence so long as they continue to share a single CPR. As the EPBES Global Assessment Record, Report on Biodiversity and Ecosystems and many others have made evident, we're now exactly in that situation Lynn described it, tied together sharing many intertwined global CPRs. 
development inequities, climate change, environmental health, and biodiversity decline have become indivisible. Either we invest in coordinating actions or we invest in coordinating actions. While social, cultural, and political differences are as pronounced as ever of anything, coexistence by necessity is becoming an imperative. The essential puzzle of governing the commons is the problem of interdependence, in which Lin was able to isolate intractable conditions to be able to understand internal mechanisms that facilitate or hinder collective action. The very conditions he isolated, the asymmetrical pollution problem, the formation of cartels, and elite capturing of resources are now the very problem that the knowledge that evolved from governing the commons and this large research community are helping us to understand and address. As governing the commons reminds us, these are not Leviathan versus Lilliputian kinds of dilemma, but one should not be paralyzed by their complexity, as Lin would say. Alternative futures are possible. You hear about these and other issues as we welcome our keynote speakers, panelists, and testimonials of Lean colleagues and students. Keynotes will be short, around 15 or so minutes, have testimonials in intervals, and four 30-minute panels that should be interesting, dynamic, and provocative. I hope you enjoyed the morning. I'll pass the word to my colleague, Professor Scott Shackelford, director of the Austrian workshop to give his welcome on behalf of the workshop and then to Professor Barra, Bar Brea Perry to welcome you on behalf of the Office of the Vice Provost for Research. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed this morning. Thanks very much, Edu, for those fantastic opening remarks and for all of your hard work on putting this together. Is the, is the sound okay? Are we getting a bit of an echo? We're, we're okay, excellent. Um, as, as Edu said, my name is Scott Shackelford. For those who don't know, I have the distinct honor and privilege of being the executive director of the Ostrom Workshop. And we're thrilled to host this conference looking back on the life and legacy of Lynn, in particular her seminal book, as you see here, Governing the Commons, which now 30 years later continues to inspire. Indeed, as our fantastic Osher Memorial lecturer, Frank Lerhoven pointed out in the research series last week, it's been cited more than 41,000 times. And if you missed Frank's lecture yesterday, I encourage you to check it out on the workshop's YouTube channel with a lot of practical advice for commoners baked in. Part of the enduring power and appeal of governing the commons, I think, is how it challenges both stereotypes and the conventional wisdom. I recently finished a biography on Rachel Carson's uh, called On a Farther Shore, and in my mind, there are some important parallels between Lynn's journey and Rachel's. Like Rachel Carson's impact on fostering the modern environmental movement, Lynn helped push the academy, as well as both policymakers and practitioners, to think critically about the commons and to empower communities to help protect these vital resource domains, as I do pointed out. As Lynn said, little by little, bit by bit, family by family, so much good can happen at so many levels. And on a personal note, Emily Castle and I are writing a children's story about Lynn called Lynn's Uncommon Life right now, which we're planning to publish with IU Press early next year, hopefully coinciding with the unveiling of Lynn's statue on campus, which we of course hope to physically welcome at some point, um, lots of uh, people back for. I've been reading drafts to a test audience of this book, my three daughters, and it's such a joy to see uh, how the barriers that Lynn overcame and the lessons she distilled in governing the commons continue to resonate with them. Um, so thank you all so much again for joining us. It's going to be a wonderful morning slash afternoon slash evening, depending on time zone. And with that, I'd like to introduce, as uh, Andrew said, I use Associate Vice Provost for the Social Sciences and Sociology Professor Bria Perry to offer one final welcome from IU's Office of the Vice Provost for Research. Thanks so much, Scott. Are you guys hearing an echo? Yeah. Hold on, let me see if I can... Is that better? That is better. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, well, that was an awkward start. Um, my name is Bria Perry, and I'm the Associate Vice Provost for Social Science Research. Um, I'm really excited to welcome you all uh, to this virtual conference, Governing the Commons 30 Years Later. I really wish that we could all be here in person on our beautiful campus. Um, it's fall and it's absolutely stunning here in Bloomington. 
Um, but nonetheless, uh, we'll celebrate, we'll move onward, um, and I'm so glad you could all be here. As many of you can imagine, Eleanor and Lynn Ostrom are a great source of pride and joy for Indiana University. Uh, we're thrilled that the Ostrom workshop and uh, Scott Shackelford under his leadership, that they have continued to honor their legacy, to celebrate their contributions to science and to society, and to extend their work in new and exciting directions. I dare say that the Ostrom's work is more important now than perhaps ever. Um, and I'm gonna keep it brief and let you all get on with your day. I hope you have an enjoyable and enlightening time at this conference today. And thanks for letting me give a quick welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Scott and Bria. Uh, we're now starting uh, with our panel and we have three just fantastic keynote speakers. I want to welcome them. First, it's my honor to introduce Professor Bonnie McKay Merritt, who is Board of Governors, Distinguished Professor Emerita at Rutgers University in the United States. A long-term collaborator of Lean, already in the mid-1970s, Professor McKay research was at the forefront of addressing questions of the commons. Her problem-oriented people ecology empirically and elegantly confronted the questions of how people respond to the challenge they face in managing natural resources, particularly fisheries. How fisheries regulate an open access commons. Over the decades, Professor McKay has led and influenced a generation of scholars and changed the discipline of anthropology and environmental anthropology in many ways, more than few. Her books, such as Questions of the Commons with James Aikson's Oyster Wars and Closing the Commons have contributed to shape the larger field that we're speaking of today. She was the president of the International Association of the Commons. She's a member of the US National Academy of Science. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Bonnie and the title of her talk, Between the Thick and the Thin. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank you very much, Edo. Thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. And, uh, you know, it's tempting to just spend the next 15 minutes sharing my personal recollections of Lynn, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to talk about methodology. So you can get out your notebooks and there'll be a quiz later. No, I'm just kidding there. This, but really, I'm going to focus on um, what I see as the essential methodology of governing the commons, which is in my terms, bringing the theoretical and logical rigor of what I will label as thin frameworks to the rich interpretive and thick narratives of life on this earth. Um, Governing the Commons, which was published in 1990, has become the Bible of the Commons movement. And um, it's the must be cited and likely most cited um, uh, in the world. It, it's it's, uh, as, as it was noted at the previous lecture, there are over 41,000 citations on Google Scholar. It's, it's, it's central to the work of scholars and practitioners who are uh, concerned about collective action toward more sustainable relationships with the natural world. And it came out of scholarship in the 1970s and the 1980s that responded critically to Garrett Hardin's dangerous and powerful notion of the tragedy of the commons. These responses by historians, anthropologists, political scientists, and others explored ways that people really have worked toward sustainable and equitable use of common pool resources. And so this scholarship generated dozens of case studies at that time and with those a rich legacy of what I'm calling thick description. In my use of this term, I borrow and adapt the language of anthropologist Clifford Gertz, who actually was also using the work of Gilbert Ryle, to mean the detailed and contextualized, highly specific and to some degree interpretive narratives, often based on intensive direct field work or archival work, more inductive than, induct more inductive than deductive. The terms used in those studies are often those of the people being studied and proof is in the interpretations made by both the people studied and the observer. Thin methodologies are the opposite, more abstract, less contextualized, more capable, therefore, of generalization 
and to be linked to explanatory frameworks or theories with the terms deriving from those frameworks or theories as much as or more than from the people involved. They have more logical rigor, may involve testable hypotheses, and can be designed to have statistical criteria for truthfulness and causation. Well, my thesis, plain and simple, is that the power and value of governing the commons lies in Eleanor Ostrom's ability to use both the thick and the thin to create a persuasive case for the commons and the commoners. Now here's some personal background. Um, in the early 1980s, Jim Atchison and I organized a session at the Society for Applied Anthropology meeting in Quebec City. We brought anthropologists together to reflect on tragedies and comedies of the commons. Uh, Jim had studied territoriality among Maine lobstermen, and I had studied the tragedy of open access among Newfoundland fishers. That conference led us to invite others to join us in a book, The Question of the Commons, which was published in 1987. And that book generally emphasized in-depth, highly particular, historically and culturally specified situations of people interacting with common pool resources. Now, Lynn Ostrom was one of the authors, and her chapter was a little different. Around that time, which was by when the IASC, or the International Association for the Study of the Commons, was created, by the way, there were a few other case study collections, all of which contributed to the development of the notion that common property exists, it's not the same as open access, and it can be very important, at least to small-scale social groups. Meanwhile, Eleanor Ostrom, with others involved in their workshop in the political theory and policy analysis at Indiana University, was instrumental in creating another approach to this, which we might call a thin social analysis, broad and highly generalized approaches. In this case, the IAD, or the Institutional Analysis and Development Framework for Policy Analysis and Design. It for, was for analyzing commons dilemmas and other collective decision problems whereby people participate in action situations, a term of this framework, which are influenced by biophysical and material conditions, attributes of their community and rules. And they interact leading to outcomes that feed back into exogenous variables and so forth. It's a system with boxes and arrows and dotted lines and other lines, an analytical framework. So anyway, back to our story. Jim Atchison and I invited anthropologist Bob Netting at Arizona to pro provide a paper for our book based on his ethnographic research with Swiss communities engaged in managing common resources, the famous Highland Alp systems. But Netting begged off, referring to devote his sabbatical to a book he was writing. A very smart man, by the way, for doing that. But he recommended that we get in touch with Eleanor Ostrom, who had asked him for data from his research. That was my first direct communication with Lynn, even though I knew of her work with Vincent Ostrom. Generous as ever, she agreed to write up her take on netting Swiss Alpine ethnography for our book, combining it with an analysis of Margaret McKean's uh, also interesting study of Japanese mountain commons. In the process of working with her on the chapter, I got to see up front and close the working of a mind trained for rigorous logical thinking, armed with the tools of rational choice and the spirit of the new institutionalism, encountering and making a certain kind of sense of the complexities, nuances, and at times obscurities of the thick case studies. As a cultural anthropologist, I was a bit taken aback by her development of numbered hypotheses, so rarely done in my field. For example, H1, to avoid the inefficiency of overgrazing, the hypothesis goes on, it is necessary to establish a system of full property rights. Or H3C, where she was reading from her, working from her reading of Netting's work, in small isolated communities with authority to make their own rules land use patterns characterized by attributes A1, A2, AN, will frequently be found with institutional arrangements containing at least one particular rule, rule I. 
In that chapter, she weighed the ethnographies against those precisely written hypotheses, and she, and she went further, searching for possible causal factors to come up with intriguing generalizations. One of my favorites, the combination of sufficient time to learn how to create successful rule systems and the capacity to monitor the results at relatively low cost are probably major factors in the long run success of these systems, by which she was referring to small isolated villages. Now, so that was based, that was her chapter for our book, The Question of the Commons. In governing the commons, she carried out that project even further, taking on more case studies, so rich in detail, but also, and I think this is why governing the commons became so important, through exceptionally clear exposition and logic. Indeed, capable of coming up with biblical results, the famous principles to self-governance the design principles. And for those, I think everyone knows those, so I'll just repeat a couple of them. Um, the, the eight principles she started with, defining clear group boundaries, um, develop a system for monitoring members' behaviors, me members' behavior, um, to provide accessible, low-cost means for dispute resolution, and so forth. Well, after 1990, this biblical governing the columns, the commons and the design principles kept scholars very busy, like how many are there really? And there's a whole literature on that. I certainly found them of use in accounting for the success of Mexican fishing cooperatives in sustainably managing their lobster fisheries and at least mitigating problems with their abalone fisheries. Indeed, I would not be surprised if a Spanish language version of governing the commons were on the shelf of at least one of the managers of, of the Mexican fishing cooperatives that we studied. It's not clear whether they learned from her or she learned from them. Meanwhile, Lynn Ostrom moved on though, concerned about issues of greater complexity and larger scale. As in her work on polycentricity, while continuing to pursue questions about, for example, the rules of communication and trust in shaping commons dilemmas in their mitigation, and, and including her work and the work she sponsored of others in, in uh, experimental economics. In these and in so many other endeavors, for we cannot forget her leadership in forest and irrigation studies, she trained, mentored, and coordinated with many, many students and colleagues many of whom we'll hear from later on in this, this morning or afternoon. Now, from IAD, she moved to another thin and productive framework for analysis, socio-ecological systems analysis, drawing even more on classic systems analysis and the study of complex adaptive systems. It has reached acronym status, SES is known now, and evolved to a more inclusive tradition of scholarship about human natural relationships with help of my friend Carl Folke, wh whom you'll hear next, and many others well known in the commons community. As with the design principles, Ostrom and others have succeeded in reaching people with the SES idea by making it abstract in general, but also accessible and responsive to the thick and messy realities of actual social and ecological relationships. The thinking that Vin, Lynn and Vince Ostrom did about polycentricity is ever more relevant. I remember her visit to my university soon after she was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. Hundreds of students and faculty attended. Wowed by the way she used this thinking to help them see viable approaches to climate change. I could see that it, it has to work at many, many different levels in different arenas and so forth, interconnected, the interdependence of things. Uh, my students were just thrilled by this talk, and they are not easily thrilled by talks from visitors. Well, this, this thinking may be as relevant in 2020. In this pandemic lockdown time of our lives, we have to grapple with the huge experiential gaps between the worlds we personally inhabit, our bubbles of relative safety, and the news we read and hear about statistics about government policies, about public and private responses of others. 
Their polycentricity reminds us that maintaining our bubbles depends on other levels and forms of response, such as policies and practices that make it possible to stay away from workplaces and other crowded venues while caring for our families. It makes us appreciate how important trust communication are. And also to see how coordination and communication at higher levels, even international, are important too for controlling the spread of the virus and developing vaccines and medicines. Well, here are some of my concluding thoughts. It is not easy to focus on the design principles these days when climate change and a major pandemic are global, not local, and when anything approaching the democratic notions inherent in the design principles are being challenged by authoritarian leaders bent on using disruption and chaos to retain power. We are in midst of crises. And the more ap apocalyptic perspectives of systems ecologists, resilience scholars, and the tipping point and Anthropocene scholars are perhaps more attractive guides to an uncertain future. However, if and when our socio-ecological systems collapse or tip into very different arrangements, perhaps governing the commons will give us principles to keep in mind as we strive to reshape our institutions for the commons. Moreover, and this is my conclusion, the essential methodology of governing the commons is bringing the theoretical, logical rigor of thin frameworks to the rich, interpretive, thick narratives of life on this earth, and we cannot do better than that. So thank you, Lynn, dear friend and colleague. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, it's a wonderful reflection. I think that kept, guided us for about 40 years to the very presence and to the kinds of challenges that we're facing today and actually offering a wonderful entry point for uh, Carl's talk that um, I'll be announcing now. Thank you very much uh, for this reflection. It's a great honor to introduce uh, also a good friend, Professor Carl Folk from Stockholm University and director of the Bayer Institute of Ecological Economics at the Royal Swedish Academy of Science. He's also the research director and chair of the board of the Stockholm Resilience Center. Also a long-term collaborator of Lean. Carl is the founding member of the Resilience, uh, one of the founding members of the Resilience Alliance, a community that Lean became closely involved over the years. Uh, Professor Folk, Carl, and collaborators, including Frickett Burks, Lean, and many, many others, pioneered the conceptualization of socioecological systems and resilience in the 1990s, paving the ground for an entire community to engage in collaborative research to understand complex human environment interactions from local to global scales. At the Berger Institute today, Carl and colleagues are leading some of the most cutting edge, cutting edge research from behavior economics to local global resource telecouplings from urban systems to technology and governance of complexity. He's a member of the Swedish Acad Royal Academy of Science and a member of the United States Academy of Science. Please join me in welcoming Professor Folk for his talk, Governing, the, for emergence in social ecological systems. Thank you, Carl, for being here, for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, see if I can get it up. Uh, this, it's, a, it's a fantastic honor and pleasure, of course, to, to be invited to celebrate Lynn and uh, her big source of inspiration for so many of us. Such a dear colleague. She came to Stockholm in, in the early 90s when we had a program where common pool resource scholars met ecological economists. Uh, and out of that, the whole thing of linking social and ecological systems emerged. Bonnie was there also and Fikert Berkes and several, several others. Uh, Lynn stayed with us for many years. She was in the board of the Bay for six years and then in the board of the Stockholm Resilience Center. And, and we, we have had, had a, an enormous amount of good times together that, that is not the right place to talk about right now. Uh, but, uh, but I will just give you some recent work we've done, very much inspired by Lin's legacy. And as you can understand, uh, the whole idea of evolution of institutions for collective action has been, has been sort of a well of inspiration for us in this part of, of the world. 
Uh, as you all know, also Lynn was deeply interested in what was going on in the, in the, in the current situation right now in the, in the Anthropocene. Uh, the, the turbulent times that Bonnie alluded to, <clears throat> the scale, connectivity and speed, the new normal and whatever people are talking about. I think what has changed a bit from when we started with the social ecological is, is a realization that people and nature now are completely intertwined, that it's, it's sort of the wrong, the wrong entry point to treat the, the social by itself with a link to the ecological or the ecological by itself with a link to the social. It's really an intertwined system and it's embedded in the planet. It's part of the planet. It's not that the planet is something external or environment is outside. We're living within it and dependent upon it. And that, that has, of course, big implications for how we do our research and, and, and how we think about the future of life uh, and, and our own future, especially on this planet. So what I will do is just to give you some two, two examples of, of this intertwinedness. One is a piece we did last fall uh, where we really try to look at what has happened with how we have been governing or misgoverning and how you want to use the term uh, the, the planet. Uh, and and um, what is really clear here is that we have created an enormous efficiency into a hyper-connected world that has basically caused a lot of simplification and loss of biosphere resilience, as well as, of course, the hyper-concentration of wealth and also growing inequalities. Uh, it, it's, it's a complex issue, and I'm not going to talk about it more than that, but, but to really basically make this illustration of, 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 of an enormous efficient activity of humans, but possibly not in a sustainable direction. The other point is that uh, because of that big uh, expansion of us on Earth and what we are doing, we are also challenging the stability of the whole Earth system, and you are all uh, pretty well aware of this, I know. But this is a piece we did in 2018 in PNAS uh, that got a lot of attention and, and it really argues that if we go beyond two degrees warming, uh, we will trigger some bigger regional tipping points on Earth, which make it compli complicated for us as a species to continue with, with good civilizations. And, and here the challenge really gets at, at trying to stabilize the planet in conditions that are favorable for humanity, which some people call Earth stewardship or biosphere stewardship, but it's not stewardship at the global level. It's, it's stewardship from the local to the global. It's, it's a shift in, in perspective and, and a shift in dynamics and, and, and really challenge for how we can transform human action into, into more sustainable pathways. And that's how we get into this idea of complex adaptive systems that Bonnie also mentioned, where, where where basically it, it looks at uh, the interplay of individuals, the interactions and relations, and, and uh, how those relations lead to patterns at higher levels and scales, uh, what some people call macroscopic pro uh, properties, that then feed back on the agents in the dynamic process. And I think that's very much what uh, Lynn had in mind, there also and many other scholars around her when she talked about the, the self-regulation and evolution of institutions, that, that whole dynamics. Uh, and, and of course, agents adjust and adapt in response to these changing conditions and contexts and, and, and uh, for the good or for the bad, actually. It could be, it could be ad adaptation into big poverty traps or could be transformations into other situations. And, and characteristics features, of course, is non-linearity potential for pathway shifts or regime shifts, some people call it cross scale interactions, and, and especially a complex, complex causality here, actually. Uh, and, and the recent paper we did for, for a year ago that Maya Schlüter has really contributed to and her, her team is to take Lin's action situation in, into a social ecological context, uh, and looking at it as a complex adaptive systems that create emergent properties. And, and out of that, we have had a lot of examples and cases in that piece. For example, the emergence of poverty traps in the Pamir Mountains or, or uh, the, the, the cod collapse in the Baltic Sea as a social ecological system, actually. But I think this is for many scholars who have used Ostrom's uh, SES framework. I think this can be an interesting piece to, 
dive into a little bit and, 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 and see what, what we talked about there. Another piece that we fairly recently did was on, on, on human behavior and trying to uh, expand human behavior from the more narrow views that you are familiar with that some parts of science are still using uh, and, and also more broader than the cause rational to something we called enculturated and, and earthed uh, behaviors. Uh, quite obvious for many of you in this, in this uh, uh, conference here. But, but the enculturated is of course concerns the broader cultural context or their social and cultural frameworks. Some people call it cultural repertoires, imagined orders, new emerging narratives. Basically the structures that give meaning to behavior. And then Earth is really about these intertwined systems and embedded in the planet. And, and I guess that despite the turbulent times we're in right now, right now I think many are, are seeing some signs of potential shifts in broader contexts and meanings for, for the human enterprise. So back in 2003, you remember a very nice piece that came out, I think a lot of other efforts that Lynn did with Tom Dietz and Paul Stern uh, in science called the struggle to govern the common, uh, which uh, I felt was a really, really important paper and uh, where they also raised the idea of adaptive governance. And we, we tried to develop that a bit later in a piece 2005 in annual reviews. And, and, and all of that was just like the 1990 book based on, based on real world observations or real world uh, analysis of cases. And, uh, and out of that, we, we just found some faces here that we thought were interesting uh, in these type of of shifts. We were, we were interested in, to look at systems that had switched from sort of uncoordinated or, or not well functioning governance into governance of whole landscapes and seascapes actually. And the first one we did was in 2004, uh, a case on, uh, in the in southern wetland landscape, an agricultural place called Kristianstad in southern Sweden, uh, where we came up with, the, with these four, four phases. And, and, and basically the preparation for transformation is where people start to connect networks and, and, uh, and often a few individuals uh, take the initiative. But they can't do much because they're constrained by the, by the current institutional setup, uh, the power structures or, what, or whatever you have. Uh, but then there's a window opportunity opening up where they can take the whole new idea and new initiative and navigate it in a transition to, to, to a new pathway and, and try to build resilience of, of, of that direction. So, so there are a lot of case studies that have actually uh, looked into this and, and, uh, and found this, that similar pattern. And what, and what we see in general of that type of emergence is, is often a, an awakening crisis that that few persons react to. And they start to develop a new type or broader vision and, and often a reframing of the earlier relationship between humans and nature. Uh, key actors, policy entrepreneurs, institutional entrepreneurs, many concepts for those things, actor groups uh, uh, start to develop and emerge. They, they connect their, their existing networks and, and also create new networks often a breaching organization. Some people talk about boundary organizations, but we look at breaching organization, uh, organizations here emerge and that to connect the, the levels and scales. Uh, and that can be, happen within new formal institutions or old ones and, and uh, often supported by enabling environments from higher, higher level of governance. So what we see here is basically an emergence from a sort of silo management to attempts to manage your landscapes and seascapes. And so, so we have shown that in, in, in several cases and, and, and it's really about collective action around it. Three examples that we studied a lot is, for example, the Southern Sweden one, Great Barrier Reef in Australia and also the, the fisheries in Southern Ocean. Uh, and here you could see that all of those cases, even the Swedish one is connected governance wise to, to global levels. 
Uh, and the interesting one with the Antarctica is that it, it's actually an, a global adaptive governance structure that manages a whole regional resource. And, and I won't have time to talk about it, but we, we summed it up in a paper in PNES in 2015, a, a bit of the challenges around that also. So this is a much more complex picture than the one I showed about the three phases, but it's basically the same three phases. And there's a whole literature coming out from the Netherlands on social technical transitions also, which we have, we have worked with that group for a long time with the last 10 years or so now. And, and, and there is a, a sort of pattern here of, of how innovation happens and or how seeds of ideas develop and, and, and can scale up to, to broader scales and create tipping points and, and, and regime shifts. Uh, and it's sort of the same story I just told you, but uh, I gave you two references here. Uh, the last one is, is uh, fairly new actually, it should be 2020 actually on that one and not 2019. Uh, the one in global environmental change, uh, which sum up, sums up quite a lot of that earlier work, but also look at social political shocks as opportunities for these type of shifts. Maybe, which may be interesting to think about in today's world actually, uh, and in the context of, of uh, the pandemic and things like that. A friend of mine, Martin Schaeffer, has an unpublished study where he has looked into big shifts in human civilizations over long periods of time. And he finds that the, the real shifts happen when the system has been a bit pre prepared beforehand. If it, if it hasn't been prepared when the shocks and crises happen, it will go back to the old power structure, basically. And, and I think in Europe, we see a little bit of shifts happening now because of a fairly long period of preparations for the Green Deal and these type of things. So I, th I think there are, th there are interesting uh, phases and moments uh, going on right now. Uh, and then to move to uh, the final part of, of this sort of expose of some things we have been doing here that ha co connects to uh, evolution of institutions and collective action. Uh, we asked the question a couple of years back, uh, in this intertwined world, can there be, the, there be actors that not only shape the economy or society, but also shape the planet as a whole? So we started with, with looking into the oceans, and there we found that there were 13 big companies, basically, that are in charge of about 20% of the whole uh, global catch and thereby also are instrumental in shaping the operation of the oceans, 13 companies. Uh, now we are working with 10 of those at the CEO level and I've been doing so for about five years to try to see if it's at all possible to shift them from looking at themselves as, as uh, merely a, a producer of seafood to, to move into uh, sustainable seafood production, but also to take a bigger shift into, into really becoming stewards of the future of the oceans. That may seem very naive actually, but, but it's interesting to note that some of those companies, three of them are in Japan, one in Korea, two Thai, the Norwegian aquaculture companies and the big fish meal companies in the world, uh, including subgroups of Cargill, uh, are now working together uh, to, to try to uh, become much more sustainable, so to speak. And, and, and we, we found it a very fas fascinating experiment, actually. It's, it's, it's a really an experiment in transdisciplinary science where you, you combine what we can mobilize from the best of, of understanding of the oceans and use that as, uh, also as a sort of pressure on the companies to, to redirect themselves. And, and in Japan, for example, they had no, nothing, nothing about sustainability uh, before, before this effort now, now started. Uh, Next week, and actually it has already influenced a lot of other broader efforts like the World Benchmark Alliance, the UN Global Compact, the High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy, and also the Friends of the Ocean Action and other efforts. So Monday and Tuesday, 
we are going to have a meeting now where these six task forces that are operating um, in this uh, in this CBOS um, effort will will hopefully set time bound goals for the actions time bound goals to redirect their activities towards more, more much more sustainable operation we call it you have to earn your right to speak before you can start to to talk about what others should do so this is basically to clean up the stuff that they are involved in uh, but it's 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 quite a, a, a enormous actually to to look at the willingness uh, we we have had tough negotiations with uh, with uh, several of the companies and co uh, but everyone is on board and and uh, hopefully uh, after tuesday we will be able to present some pretty major commitments now from these companies that i think has the potential to lead to pretty pretty drastic cascade effects in the whole sector and and also with implications for for the oceans of course so that's what i had on my agenda you can see that lean is there all over it and 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 it's about new forms of collective action new type of interactions and and, and new type of challenges for which uh, the space that she started to create together with people like bonnie and fikret and others has, has uh, it's amazing to see the usefulness of that whole approach thank you very much thank you carl this fantastic overview and connection between all the tools that comes from the governing the commons and the kinds of problems that we're dealing today but also for linking that to action you know and i think adding to bond in giving us that sense of hope you know that there are approaches in which those issues that are global and complex can be addressed uh, and build upon i mean this legacy that we are uh, celebrating today uh, without further ado uh, and thank you very much all of you for being uh, like following the time we're on schedule and very happy about it it's an honor to introduce our next keynote speaker professor barbara allen who is the james woodward strong professor of political science at carleton college in the united states an iu alum barb studied with vincent and over the years barb became a close member of the austrian family living in their house over several occasions she has produced a documentary on their lives and works, a fantastic film available in public television, Actual Words, Possible Futures, The Lives and Work of Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom, and added two large volumes of papers that Vincent left unpublished over the course of his long career. Ellen's research has focused on how Tokyo View and the concept of covenant help us to understand US democracy. We do need it now, right now. In her new book, uh, very much to speak to those issues, a co-authored book, Truth in Advertising, On Lies in Political Advertising, which received the 2019 American political group Richard Nudstu uh, Award. She's a she has a unique perspective on the Ostrom, having known them as a student, colleague, and co close friends for most of, of her life. We couldn't be more honored to have Barb here with us. Please join me in welcoming Professor Allen for her talk, misinformation, knowledge, know-how in self-governed commons. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. And that was a very generous introduction. I am just so honored to be here today and to um, have an opportunity to celebrate with everyone. It's wonderful to see everyone's faces again. I hope that what I have to say will build on what Bonnie and Carl have uh, given us so far um, I, I so appreciate the idea of hope that is at the foundation of what they've uh, told us. And I think that what I have to say bears a bit on the idea of finding your voice and being able to share information and to think more about information and some of the ways that we can deal with misinformation in the public sphere. 52 years ago, Garrett Hardin published The Tragedy of the Commons. And in that he sounded, and I think Bonnie is absolutely correct, he sounded a dangerous alarm for fellow scientists and environmentalists. He said that we cannot wait for voluntary 
solutions to global problems, such as the problem he was addressing, overpopulation. He described population pressure as a single instance of a problem type, a commons, a situation in which no one supposedly, according to him, could feasibly be excluded and where each subtracts leaving less for the rest. And I suppose we can be grateful to him for putting the idea out into the public, into uh, common, in common parlance. Um, but his idea was that in such circumstances, no one has an incentive to cooperate in caring for the resource, quite the opposite. Each can be expected to grab, use, or hoard as much as they possibly can to fend off others who are expected to do the same. According to Hardin, the only solution is to turn the problem over to the government. And yes, of course, I have heard of the market, but if you read carefully, the government must regulate through command and control and manage the commons, or the government regulates the markets that produce property rights. And so it's either markets or states, yes, of course, but it boils down to states or states in the tragedy of the commons argument. Three years before Hardin published this work, Eleanor Ostrom had shown that people sharing a water resource in common could self-regulate and could, working within government authority structures, could with government co-produce an enforceable, mainly self-managed governance system for their commons. It was a step to go from self-managed to self-governed. In 1968, when Hardin was publishing his work, Dismissing Voluntary Action, Lynn was delivering a paper at the Midwest Political Science Association in Chicago on the logic of constitutional choice and the incentives to organize voluntary and co-producing institutions for collective action. Lynn's work was based on observing the realities on the ground where people managed their commons and governed themselves. She made the step from management to governance. Governing the commons in 1990 presented the empirical evidence of people working together to solve dilemmas and the, use the institutional arrangements that they had designed to achieve such effects. The culmination of nearly three decades of research, Governing the Commons introduced readers to eight design principles derived from field study of various commons that had been self-managed in a sustainable way. Her studies also alerted scholars to other concepts, as Bonnie has mentioned. Action arenas and the action situation and the three levels of action, as well as some of the rule types that we find in the Institutional Analysis and Development Framework, the IAD. The IAD emerged as a way of thinking about institutional development and change in the late 1970s. In Lynn's words, the purpose of such a framework is to identify the elements and general relationship among these elements, the ones that one needs to consider for institutional analysis in order to organize diagnostic and prescriptive inquiry. As has been said, the framework was a general way of being able to compare theoretical notions that were more specific about variables that we needed to understand for governing the commons. The IAD beneficially helps us see the differences among levels of choice, first to constitute the group, second to create the rules by which the group will make collective choices, and third to think about operational decisions as the very specifics that one makes within the framework set out by collective choices. Also embedded in the IAD framework, was an idea of biophysical systems. 
But this concept was far less developed compared to the ideas of rules in use, the grammar of rules, and all of the social science elements that went into talking about attributes of the community. And to a degree, this makes sense because the idea about the bio biophysical spaces had to emerge in the study of actual cases and conditions. Later, the SES framework, which comes about in the decades following governing the commons, helped us structure research and helped us understand better the relationship between ecological systems and social systems. In fact, the argument made within the SES framework is that these are, inter these are linked in a way that cannot be separated, and to understand each is to understand both. My comments today bear on two elements found in each of these frameworks, information and knowledge. These ideas include information sharing and knowledge in the social ecological systems framework, along with what is described as our mental models. These are variables in the SES framework, in the IAD framework, to which I want to turn for a second in a little diagram to remind you of that. In the, S in the IAD framework, the variable is information, and it is conceptualized here as being about the internal workings of an action situation. It is information specifically about complex objects such as the roles of the actors, the positions of the actors, control over the um, linkages that join the actors to potential outcomes, and information about the outcomes and information about the link. So information is seen as internal to the action situation. And I think what's critical here is to understand that the information is made up of two types, what we might call facts, which are brute facts, such as the facts to do with um, temperatures rising or falling, and facts that we would understand as informational, or sorry, institutional facts. Institutional facts certainly are those that must be interpreted and must be understood in a schema. And one of the things that we see in looking at the idea of information sharing in the SES and with thinking about information and control over the linkages between actors and potential outcomes is that it is this d discourse on the way that we interpret institutional facts that really matters. So interpreting facts may influence the calculus that we have of costs and benefits. Interpreting facts may in involve the calculus that we have of risk. And so the big question is, what do we know about facts? What do we know about information? And here I'll turn to my work in misinformation and lying in political advertising. And I'll say a few words about the kinds of things that we have learned, my colleagues and I, uh, not only in our own research, but in the research of many others. I think many of you know that in the 1970s, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman wrote a very famous article in which they showed that you can frame information in diverse ways and people will understand the information differently and make different choices based on their interpretation of the information. But since Kahneman and Tversky wrote that, that um, piece and that book and a famous article, a great deal of work has gone on. We know, for example, that framing is an activity that elevates specific considerations that bear on a decision. And framing is not, importantly, is not persuasion. Beliefs do not change. All we have done is change the way that people are looking at the information in a given choice set. We also know from the work of Jamie Druckmann and Dennis Chong that two strong frames can potentially lead to useful contestation. 
So for example, if we have a frame that leads us to, to uh, the question is whether or not we might allow a protest march, and we have a strong frame of free speech and rights of assembly and so forth, that will elevate those considerations in making the decision about the protest march. If that, meets, if that frame meets with the equally strong frame of public safety, there will be a discourse potentially that can be very protective. The kind of contestation that I think is known at the workshop, and Druckmann and Chong don't use that word, that's a workshop type term, but that contestation may be protective of some third way instead of an either or, a both and. In some contrast, their work, Druckmann and Chong's work, shows that a strong frame meeting up with a weak frame, say for example, a framing of the uh, inconveniences of traffic flow during a protest march, a strong frame and a weak frame meeting up together, the weak frame is in fact so diminished as to undermine the entire discourse. I think when one considers a topic such as climate change, thinking about the way that we frame climate change problems and strong frames and weak frames in this arena, we may have some, we may find some use for this new information about framing. What we also know from our work is that counter-attitudinal facts, that would be ideas that people have already and presenting them with facts that are counter to those attitudes, counter-attitudinal facts raise anxieties. And as a result, we know from the work of George Marcus and Michael McEwen that anxieties lead to more information searches. And that probably sounds like good news, and it is good news, except that further research, including the re research, the work of my colleagues um, on political advertising and trying to fact check political ads and debunk false narratives, we've found, along with the work of David Redlosk, that in, that in fact, people are motivated by existing attitudes to search for information that is confirming of those existing attitudes. So motivational biases cause people to pursue strategies of information gathering that will not debunk, will not put into use the new information. This is a very troubling kind of concept, the idea of a motivational bias. In our work, we have also found, however, that we can cue principled information processing. That is, we can cue people to return to their principles stated often in the abstract when they evaluate an actual situation that might cause them to have a motivational bias. In our work, these would be motivations such as partisanship or ideology. We can cue individuals to return to principled information processing, or in other words, processing of information that enables them to incorporate the new information. That sounds like good news. However, before we draw that conclusion, I want to tell you how difficult it is for us to do that. We have not only information searches that are biased by motivation, mo motivated information processing, we also have problems of motivated resistance to facts. We have problems of accepting the facts, but differentially up, updating one's beliefs, and we have problems of different differential interpretations of the facts that have been accepted. And what I mean by this is that we have individuals who will, first of all, reject new information, and we have found ways of cueing people so that they are less rejecting of new information. We still have problems with people applying the new information to update their belief structures and to make different decisions. And we have the problem that the information after it is accepted 
may be interpreted in ways that allow the old beliefs and the old behaviors to persist. So we're not out of the woods yet. What does this have to do with the situation of the commons? Well, I would say that one of the things that we want to look back to is some of the principles would be one of the eight design principles that Lynn offered to us. And to consider how those eight design principles might work with our thinking about information. So I'm going to turn to them now. The eight principles have been discussed and these are the eight principles that we have and I think everybody pretty much knows what they are. These have been discussed, these have been updated, these have been uh, to some degree evaluated. They also have been augmented and morphed a little bit into now 11 design principles in one uh, later work. Um, other people have updated them to maybe 40 design principles, but here are some of the 11 that have been more recently tested. These have been tested in empirical situations to see if we have any utility in these design principles as we look at, in, as we either study institutions or set out to design institutions. When you compare these two lists, there are a couple of things that I think you can see might be being left out or really changed in the updated versions. Here we have something called nested enterprises. Here we have something called coordination of government and community. My argument would not be that either of these is wrong. So I would, of course, I think coordination is an important part, but looked at from the point of view of information. Let me point out what nested enterprise might have connected to. I think in the Ostrom vocabulary, nested enterprise imagined larger and smaller arenas of action, more or less in company encompassing scope and scale, uh, potentially concurrent authority, and in that sense, polycentricity. So nested enterprise, I don't want to draw too strong a link, but let me bring the concept of polycentricity in for a moment, please. We are all very concerned with the local. And it is absolutely the case that when people are trying to factor in new information and dispel misinformation and lies, they, re, they use knowledge that exists and what we have already found in many of our studies, knowledge that exists from actual hands-on participation is the knowledge that matters most to thinking that you can be a self-governing human being. If you have participated in self-governance and understand what it takes to govern yourself, if you have worked in groups and built something in a community, it is, we have found it is much more difficult to take that participation and dissuade you of all the things that you've learned through, as Bonnie put it, sort of an authoritarian speechification. It is much more difficult to tell people about their own experiences and dispel their own direct experience with governing themselves than it is to dispel their experience when they have had little experience with self-organization, self-management, or self-governance. We know that this kind of face-to-face -face interaction can happen at the local level, but before we get too excited about the Lilliputin, or before we get too excited about the local only, it never was small is beautiful or small is best. Small can be very parochial. Small can be very insular. Small can be not about them, about us. And these we also know are some of the major problems with the way that disinformation, misinformation, and lying works. So one of the things that polycentricity and coordination make possible is to move beyond the parochial group, to force an engagement with others that may not be in your immediate circle, and to force the kind of contestation in a productive 
coordinated overall authority structure is one of the ways that we are finding we can dispel misinformation, disinformation, and lying in a public arena. When we lose polycentricity, we are losing the opportunity for people to enlarge their thinking and enlarge their conception of self and other or self-interest in that way. These are Tocquevillian ideas. These are Vincent Ostrom ideas. These are Eleanor Ostrom ideas. And I just want to suggest that these are at the heart, not only of governing the commons, but of at the heart also of understanding institutional diversity and Lynn's great concern for questions of equity, justice, right, and capacity of human beings overall. Thank you. Thank you for this fantastic to you know, completing this wonderful three um, keynotes. And I think you have you know, helped us to unpack issues of the IAD that we usually don't pay as much attention to as mental models and information. Uh, you made a fantastic connection between John Searle's institutional fact all the way to the current discussion of framing as applied to the kinds of conundrums that we're facing. Thank you very much to all three of you. Uh, we'll jump straight into our first panel and then we'll have a break when we'll have a testimonial uh, from uh, Jim Walker. And I'll pass now the word to my colleague, Scott, uh, Shackelford to introduce the first panel, Social Ecological Thinking and Practice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edu. And thank you all again for the fantastic keynotes. It's already been such a tour de force. Um, but we still have four panels. And as Edu said, three testimonials to go. So really, we're just getting started. Um, and we're going to kick things off with our first panel, chaired by Professor Dan Cole. It's called The Impact of Governing the Commons on Social Ecological Thinking and Practice. And uh, just to briefly introduce uh, Professor Cole, and then he in turn will introduce the rest of the panelists. So Professor Cole, as many of you know, is an internationally recognized environmental law and economics scholar. He's writing uh, mostly at the intersection of law, economics, and politics of property, natural resource law, land use, and environmental protection. He's also written extensively um, about Poland and Polish law. And he's the author of seven books and more than 40 articles. He's also an award-winning teacher. He's the founder of a uh, founding member of both the Midwest Law and Economics Association and the Society for Environmental Law and Economics and is a life member of Clare Hall at the University of Cambridge where he was a visiting scholar. So um, thank you so much, Dan, for chairing this first panel for us and over to you. Thank you, Scott, and uh, hello, everybody. I'm not gonna take uh, any time except to introduce uh, the panelists because we were short on time and I want them uh, to have as much time as possible. They're each gonna talk about a different aspect of how uh, governing the commons relates to uh, later social ecological thinking and practice. And we're very fortunate to have uh, four outstanding uh, scholars and workshoppers uh, on this panel. Uh, I'm gonna present them in the order they appear on the agenda and I suppose they can present in that order as well. Uh, first, we'll have Harini Nagendra, who's from uh, Azam Premi, Premji University in India. Claudia Paul Wustel uh, from University of Osnabrück in Germany. Juan Camilo Cardenas from uh, Univ Universidad de los Andes in Colombia. And Sergio Villamayor Tomas from the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain. So a truly global panel for this truly global uh, conference. So Harini, please go ahead. And it's good to see you. Thank you. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here and uh, you know, listening to these lovely talks. So this is really exciting. I, we agreed to keep these very short. So we have hopefully some time for audience questions. I'll just start by saying that for me, uh, trained as an ecologist coming into the workshop, reading Governing the Commons, interacting with Lynn and the other workshoppers, I found this fascinating because of the breadth of insights that they had, right? from evolutionary theory and ecology to behavioral economics, from politics to anthropology to sociology. So to me that, the first thing I'd like to highlight is that imagination and vision is what to me really sets governing Coppens apart from the rest. And I think 
a big indicator of the influence and the reason why it connected and gave meaning to so many people. You would find, as I said, I mean, the times you came for a brown bag lunch, you'd meet an evolutionary biologist talking to an anthropologist or a, uh, someone deep in discussions of behavioral economics, politics, GIS, modeling. That is why, you know, so I think that was a hallmark of this book that it had such a breadth of perspective. It had interdisciplinarity, truly interdisciplinarity at the core. And something we see often today as interdisciplinary researchers, for instance, in COVID times, is the challenge of doing interdisciplinarity while still moving disciplinary fields forward, right? Without sacrificing analytical depth, without falling into a trap of superficiality. It's so easy to do that, saying that, well, I have a model, I'm a hammer searching for a nail. So I have a physics model and I can move it to epidemiology or I have an epidemiology model, but I don't know about human behavior, but that's fine, I can fix that later, right? This governing the commons was, to me, true interdisciplinarity at the core, which, which managed to straddle that boundary of looking analytically, looking with depth, not being superficial, but at the same time, this just grand scope and vision. So I think that explains why 30 years ahead, 30 years later, there are so many of us here, you know, thousands of us across the world working on these issues, still motivated, still fascinated, still finding new things. So that's the first thing that I want to talk about the governing the commons and what it means in today's times. I think the second part, which is equally uh, visionary to me, is the fact that all the work that it took forward took a commons approach to the entire process of research. So no part of this research was ever non-collaborative. Every part of, you know, from the workshops uh, design on to, and as Lynn always said, Lynn and Vincent said, it was as much a crafts place as a, as a place for work, right? So the idea of crafting into the workshop, the spirit of uh, commoning, the fact that values and norms were not just things we study, but things that motivate us personally. I think anyone who's been a workshopper will address, attest to the sort of the remarkable feeling of family when one comes into a place like this. And I think that's the second reason we don't, as academics, often talk about our personal motivations for doing research, but I think this is something that binds all of us together. And so that to me again is a very fundamental motivator. And the third, I think, is just the meaning that Lynn's work now has to so many different areas of the commons. I mean, speaking again for myself, one of the things I started working with Lynn on towards the last few months of her life was looping back to where she started from, looking at urban research again. And we started looking at a lot of urban commons research in Bangalore. Uh, with commons, of course, you can't apply the design principles because they're not static, enduring, long enduring commons. They're uh, very much places in, in flux. So we moved to looking at the SES framework. And to me, the SES framework is, again, remarkable because of how it advances a lot of the, the work that governing the commons played and is now helping us unpack so many things. I mean, like Bob was talking about polycentric commons of climate change, things that Dan also works on, uh, looking at information commons, looking at urban commons. It, it's moving into so many areas. So I think, again, 30 years later, reflecting on this, just the, the scope, the vision, and the fact that you can have this vision without sacrificing depth and becoming superficial. To me, that's the amazing part of governing the commons. So I'll stop here. Great. Okay. Uh, Claudia is next. Uh, so go ahead, Claudia. Thanks. It's also really a big pleasure for me to be able to be on this panel and also share my thoughts and about Lynn's work and also working with her. For me, a key contribution of Lynn's work was really to highlight the importance of self-organization for understanding governance and how people manage their resources and really to pave the way to deal with such complexity. As a scholar coming from complex systems, I was really thrilled and pleased when I first read her 1990 book. It was so different and inspiring compared to other kinds of literature on the topic, which either had this very simple views on human behavior, very static, or you had this very descriptive and deep case studies. I think her re work really started to pave a middle way in between these things and move towards understanding and facing complexity of social ecological systems. And the book promoted as well a focus on agency on processes of learning that can change human environment interactions. Something very important for my final conclusion that's definitely much more motivating and inspiring than what has been discussed before. Then the question was how to capture complexity, how to really develop a structured approach to deal with complexity of social interactions and, uh, and in social ecological systems. 
and the design principle were a first response to search for some ordering principles. And in her 1990 book, Lynn offered first some hypotheses. We heard from this from Bonnie in her talk about uh, such principles. Then the IID framework was required to develop the knowledge base for really eliciting them. And this was really such a framework and sharing it among many researchers was a major first step towards the structured approach of dealing with this complexity and building such a knowledge base. And also promoting the use of shared framework is also one of the big contributions of this work. We had been working more on the CES club, trying to promote more um, broad community on using the CES framework. And as a community, I think we can still do better in using shared frameworks, which would allow us much more to elicit more broadly insights from the, all the work we are doing. Uh, so I already talked about the CES framework. A more visible move in her work definitely happened with the 2007 PNIS paper on the CES framework. This paper not only emphasized more the ecological component, it also promoted more explicitly a diagnostic approach, which implies that the importance of a design principle may differ according to social ecological context and problem setting, which may have been more implicit already before, but I guess this made things much more explicit, this kind of approach. And such a kind of diagnostic approach is definitely the way how we should go where we really want to understand the complexity of social ecological systems. In particular, also to support um, transformative change in human environment relationships at different scales as well and levels, because the idea of a diagnostic and approach and design principles definitely is not only important for local um, level only. And such thinking uh, has guided much of our recent work on water governance and governance also on the water energy food nexus. So let me close more with a brief outlook also on ongoing but also future developments. I think that we need more design principles that really relate to processes. What guides transformative change and societal learning processes under different conditions? And such principles should also inform and become part really of learning processes, not only study processes, but engage more actively with learning processes. So I argue very much in favor of more action research, which really engages stakeholders in the research process. That is more a more radical move towards applying a transdisciplinary diagnostic approach. And with this, I want to close and look forward also, hopefully, to some ex um, opportunities to later engage with the audience. Okay, thank you, Claudia. Uh, Juan Camilo. Thank you, Dan. Um, this is a great gathering, and, and it's good to, to see. Can you turn your microphone up a little bit? Thanks. Can you, can you hear me there? Yeah. So I, I was saying that this is, this is a great gathering and thank you, Dan, for coordinating this panel. And thank you to Harini, Claudia, and Sergio for being here in this panel. I think this combination shows what, what the workshop at what Lynn and Vincent always wanted to create in these dialogues. And I'm going to uh, briefly go over two points or three points that I think are interesting in terms of what this panel is about regarding the socio-ecological systems and how Governing the Commons has shaped a lot of the work that we have done from different perspectives. Uh, my work has been mostly on bringing uh, experiments and experimental economics into the field, uh, bringing the lab to the field and study these issues of, of the commons and these issues of managing natural resources. And, and in that sense, um, I wanted to, to pose a paradox. Um, a paradox that probably only Lynn could see from the beginning, and that is on how um, a systems or complex systems approach that SES uh, framework is about uh, can be also uh, converse and interact with such a positivist approach that is the use of lab experiments and the use of experimental tools in which we have a, a careful design to try to test causal relationships and to control variables and manipulate variables. And this paradox was something that, that Lynn had no trouble with. Um, this was probably what Harini was mentioning before about the artisanship, this craftsmanship of the workshop. And this is why um, governing the commons is such a masterpiece in inviting us into this artisanship of 
having tools and confront these complex issues of governing the commons and, and bringing in tools from different disciplines. I mean, governing the commons is not about political science only. It's not only about economics. Governing the commons is all about psychology and sociology and anthropology. And, and all these approaches are coming in together, but also with multiple tools and working together. The latest book that she published with Amy, who is here, and Marco Jansen, it's about that combination not only of disciplines but also of tools and going in the commons was a master a masterpiece in that sense of opening us inviting us to that artisanship of combining these different tools and uh, in the case of social ecological systems uh, we probably all agree that we require um, in that analysis in that framework both context and also the micro behavioral foundations and this is key here because it was all the way in the beginning in governing the commons. These micro foundational issues interacting with the context. And we have been hearing here great people talking about all these things. And what I wanted to mention is that Lynn was able through governing the commons to bring the field into this conceptual analysis of thinking both context and micro foundations. Um, and then she wanted to expand her toolkit. She always was looking for more tools. And, and then came uh, something that I think is also a masterpiece, which is Rules, Common, Rules Games and Common Pool Resources. This is, this is a book that has over 6,000 citations too. And, and this is not easy for a, such a technical book and, and a masterpiece also for behavioral and experimental economics. And Jimmy Walker is here, one of the main authors of this book. And he struggled with Lean on how to get this complex systems approach of context, rules, norms, into a control environment of a, of a laboratory experiment and think about the micro behavioral foundations of the problems of the commons. And that is something remarkable that we should be thinking all together. So when, when you combine these two things, then you have a, an incredible array of frameworks, tools to get together and then put them into action to think about the context interacting with the micro foundations of the commons. And I just wanted to say this is a huge challenge for those working with SES and at the same time, those working with micro behavioral foundations of the problems of the commons. And the experiments are usually about manipulating one variable and then controlling everything else. And SES is about many things interacting at the same time. And that's a paradox that Lean was always aware of. That's a paradox that we need to get to work together with many tools and many approaches. And probably by, by combining these different tools, something that we all learned from Lynn and Vincent, we probably continue to move forward to understand the challenges of the commons. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Juan Camilo. Last but not least, Sergio, please. Sergio, you're, you're muted, so. Second chance to start over again. I was just saying that I'm uh, honored to be here with you all. Uh, so many nice faces. I almost could see through Jimmy Walker's window in Bloomington. Fantastic. Um, I want to quickly reflect on, on the method behind governing the commons. Um, in my view, the design principles uh, are to a great extent the result of a large review of published case studies. This review was encoded in a database called the Common Pool Resource or CPR database. And it was the result of a collaborative effort uh, with the Dela Schlager, Bill Bloom case, or so. It's interesting to read in the preface of the book how Eleanor Ostrom presented her contribution as, and I quote, interim progress report for an ongoing research effort. I think that ongoing research effort was the CPR among other things, the CPR database. The method of systematic uh, reviews of case studies or what some of us call qualitative meta-analysis 
has gotten increasing popularity among such environmental scholars, particularly those interested in complex socio-ecological systems. The method allows to compare, validate, and make sense of findings that are scattered in the literature, and sometimes also encoded in different concepts. The method nowadays is very popular, I believe, because there is an increasing interest in the study of complexity, as it's been showed before. And likely also because publication rates, access to publications have also increased a lot. To translate the case study data into a CPR database, Lynn and her team had to interview the text of case studies. And for that, they had to develop a standardized forms or instruments with open and closed questions. When you look at those forms, you realize of two things. First, you can see already there that there was a genuine interest in characterizing the resource system, the biophysical, along with the social system and management rules, of course. And second, you can see the level of detail and systematic thinking that was put into those forms. That's very impressive to me. I've barely rarely seen uh, coding forms like those. I believe, maybe I'm wrong, that Lynn, Governing the Commons, the CPR database, and Adela, Iltang, were pioneers of the method. I personally benefited from the inspirational work in a number of meta-analyses already. Just to finish, the preface of the book also says that, and I quote, the development of the coding forms was itself an exercise in theory development. I couldn't agree more with this, this statement. I would add that developing the coding book is the most challenging stage of a qualitative meta-analysis of case studies. And that has to do with the fact that you have to think about theory and how to build theory. There's a lot of theory development in the Lina coding book. And it's difficult because it's very difficult to find a middle ground between contextualized details of the case studies and some general patterns, just like it was uh, said before. Uh, this is why I think uh, Adela and Bill uh, did with the coding forms and what Lynn in turn did again with her design principles. She always reminded us of her struggles to formulate the design principles for that very reason. I always remember those words when I start a new coding book. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sergio. So I think we're ready to uh, open it up for uh, for questions. Anybody? Somebody's got to have a question. It looks like Dan, there's a couple in the Q and A uh, box there. Okay, so here's. I can, uh, I can. I've already started with Chris Shaw, the small exchange, because he asked whether this diagnostic approach would very much uh, would very much support a very expert kind of study, which means that researchers come as doctors and prescribe. And just my final comment that this participatory approach just shows that no, no, I don't consider the diagnostic approach is a kind of expert statement where we provide the scientists the solutions but it can much more help the scientists need to develop the tools to be able to compare experience exchange across cases. But really how these, let's say, what is implemented need to be developed and tailored together in a participatory process together with uh, stakeholders in various cases. So, and uh, Scott just asked whether the design principle and assess framework fully allowed to incorporate this important change. I guess it might require a few more variables, <laughs> more, more, let's say, uh, more constructed approach, more constructivist approach, but in principle, you can apply the SES framework in such a participatory setting. The question is how you use it and how you use the insights from such a framework and embedded in the process, just to kick off the discussion. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Klaus Eisenach, uh, at Humboldt University in Berlin uh, asked a question about what is the next level of meta studies slash coding slash case study databases? Do we continue as in past years or are there ways to scale up uh, such research? 
Uh, I, in some respects, this is a reference to the uh, IFRI uh, database and similar databases that have, were started uh, decades ago. Uh, and uh, so he's asking about uh, if there's anybody working on, you know, different databases or, or a way of scaling up the existing ones. Anybody have any thoughts on that? I can say a couple of words about that. Um, yeah, I think I don't know about scaling up geographically because, well, Klaus himself has already good experience uh, in doing meta analysis. Uh, he has a nice paper on water governance. And by the way, he's implemented a modeling approach to qualitative meta analysis that I, that I like very much. But maybe there's a way to scale out in a way. Uh, this effort that scientists are doing um, in collecting data from cases, which is uh, involving uh, the actual stakeholders and people who have, have practice in, in all these uh, cases of management in, in, in sort of input in these online databases that are being created. And that's a, that's a challenge. I mean, if, we, if we as scholars sometimes find difficult uh, to, to find the right incentives to, to sustain our efforts and, and put all that data in those databases, uh, I can imagine that it's also very challenging for, for non-scientists to do it. So I believe a, a great step would be to make it more citizen-wise in a way, that those kind of efforts. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go back to a couple earlier questions. Uh, I'm not sure whether they were for the um, uh, were for the the talks uh, earlier, the um, keynotes, or for this panel. But uh, I'll throw them out there anyway. Uh, one is uh, how to use Ostrom's frameworks in studying common local governments governance of natural resources impacted by global drivers of economics and climate change? I guess this is a, a, a question mainly about cross scale. How, you know, how do we take account of, uh, of global drivers when we're trying to look at local self-governance? Uh, perhaps I can say, I, I, we have used partly Ostrom's for, uh, Linz framework or another framework that we further developed. Uh, and I think what you need to do is to really take this as kind of boundary conditions that constrains local governance. Hmm? You could also work on scenarios, but in the end, uh, I would say if you really want to study local governance, uh, that normally local governance can't really have much impact on global drivers. So I would just say that uh, you should use this as a kind of conditions that constrain local action, but also to feed back from there and say, right, that's how far local action can go. And uh, you need to work more at the global level in order to really, you can't solve everything at locally. So also to find to really to see how uh, the, the, the limits of local action in dealing with certain problems when you have global drivers. So that's yeah, to, to some extent, it seems like a question about uh, polycentricity or polycentric analysis uh, and scaling up and, and scaling down uh, uh, the analysis. Uh, so, step in there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I would, so, because this is something we face with the urban commons a lot. And you know, you can't think of anything as open as a city uh, in terms of porous boundaries. I saw the other question on the high seas also. The, the challenge really here is that there is a two-way loop in, in, in many cases. For instance, climate change is a classic one where, uh, so you know, if you went back to classic hierarchy theory and polycentric systems are hierarchical, you would say you have your system of analysis, go one level below and one level above, and you're okay. And that's in some sense how the SES talks about it, about external factors that, that constrain it. But if you look at climate change, for instance, cities are reshaping regional climate. So there's also that, you know, the feedback effect that goes from the local to modify the global. So I think we're seeing far more complex patterns than we used to see. And we really, we have to struggle. We need new analytical tools. And uh, there may be ways to modify the polycentricity analysis frameworks. And 
but I, I think we really need to think this is an area of challenge we haven't solved. Great, thanks, thanks, Harini. In fact, while while your mic is on, uh, Barb had a question for you. But, uh, oh asking you to talk more about the approach of the SES uh, framework as a diagnostic tool without necessarily putting oneself forward as the expert. Hmm. So I'm not sure what, what you mean, Bob, by a, not, not necessarily putting yourself forward by the expert, but I guess what, uh, I mean, reflecting back on a lot of what our research is showing us, We've been trying to use people as, ex I mean, looking at the expert knowledge of people and even within cities. I know we normally talk about indigenous people as experts and looking at their, you know, local knowledge. But what you find is people in cities also have, it, they might be very urban for several generations, but have their own local knowledge. Putting that into the SES framework has been very uh, uh, useful for us. And I think Hita might talk about this more in another uh, panel later. But it's been extremely useful for us in trying to, in terms of rethinking some of these principles. Again, I think when we come at this with an analytical lens, we're often separating out categories. And when people deal with them, they just, they think of them as seamless, you know, nature versus society, for instance, or the moral imperative versus the economic imperative. We're slicing and dicing, they don't. And so that to me is, is sort of the challenge of how do you use this SES framework when you actually talk to people and get their knowledge. You're muted. Be muted, Dan. Yeah. And sorry, I, uh, we will probably, unfortunately, be needing to wrap up the first panel here. Uh, but if there's maybe one final question or thought, Dan, if you wanted to call anybody else out. Oh, I think you might still be muted. I'm sorry. That's okay. Sorry. There we go. There was. Uh, there was one more question for uh, for Juan Camilo for a little more clarification on the paradox he identified. I think he said he had to step off for a class. Oh, okay, he did. Gotcha. Well, in that case, we have no more questions, and I think we're ready for a five-minute break, and we come back yeah. for the next panel. Is that right, Scott? Yeah, no, thank you so much, Dan, and thanks again to all the panelists. That was fantastic. <laughs> Virtual round of applause there. Um, as you might be aware, we're running just a little bit behind schedule, about 10 minutes. Normally, we would just sacrifice the breaks to get back on uh, time, but we have video testimonials pre-recorded. So we're going to do our best just to push everything back by 10 minutes and then keep everything else on schedule because I know people have conflicts, etc. Our first video testimonial is going to be uh, from Jimmy Walker, former workshop director, Ostrom Senior Research Fellow. Um, leading light in this discipline has already been pointed out. I have a laundry list of accomplishments I could read uh, for Jimmy. But again, since time is short, I'm sure he won't mind if we go uh, more or less right to his testimonial. So watch, I think David already has uh, queued up for us. So thanks so much again to everybody. It's been a fantastic day so far. And Jimmy, over to you, virtually. <laughs> it's a real honor to be here today, to be able to provide a few comments related to governing the commons. But in some ways, more importantly, at least in my career, to what followed governing the commons. Um, I came to Indiana in 1984, and I think it was somewhere around 1986 that um, Lynn contacted me. I'd been doing public good experiments and for many years with my colleague, Mark Isaac. And Lynn had had this trip to Bielefeld where she studied with, worked with Reinhard Zelton. And she came back with this uh, desire to, to bring more formal analysis through game theory into the broad scope of work at the, at the workshop, but also uh, this interest in experimental methods. And she contacted me. I, you know, I knew Lynn a bit, but we really, um, it was one weekend, and she contacted me about getting interested in experiments and maybe writing an, an NSF grant, which, which we did. So I think it was probably around 1986 that we began to talk about and start to, to conduct our first experiments with Roy Gardner, game theorist. And looking back on it, um, I, this, this occurred to me that after Mike McGinnis's talk on Monday, uh, Christopher Anderson brought up the question about formal hypotheses and research design in, in Lynn's work related to governing the commons, et cetera. And 
I, I always thought maybe the reason Lynn really got interested in experiments was because she was just interested in multiple methods of analysis. But after this discussion the other day, it occurred to me that maybe the other aspect of that trip to Bielefeld was Lynn saw this as a way to bring more formal research design and hypotheses theoretical based on theoretical game theoric notions into into the research that she was conducting. It's clear that Lynn had this interest in bringing people together and bringing multiple methods together. She had this interest in cumulative knowledge. And it, it was just striking that how the breadth of her work and the breadth of people that she brought into this work. So what I'd like to talk about just a little bit is not governing the commons, an incredible contribution to the literature and having a major impact on many people we know around the world. But that book led to this book, Rules, Games, and Common Pool Resources. And why I want to touch on it is because it's in this book. The book does report sort of a summary of many of our experiments, but it begins with a formal analysis of thinking about common pool resources and the types of games, the types of structures that might be involved in those settings. And then it moves on to, again, formal analysis and experiments, but it also ends with a chapter uh, going back to the field. And in this case, uh, the, along with Lynn, there's a chapter written by Bill Blomquist, Zella Schlager, and Xu Yan Tang. And I think it's interesting, this is just one more way uh, in which Lynn would have affected people's research programs, but also brought people together and also brought research together. Uh, it's, it's just striking in the sense of that scope and that interest that she had uh, in, in this type of cumulative process. This, this time over, over time, this building of ideas in this building of research. So I think I'll end with that. Again, uh, it, it's, it's just an incredible opportunity. It was an incredible opportunity to be career wise to work with Lynn, but also others at the workshop and to have that breadth that comes with not just being sort of in your, your silo of being in a disciplinary department, but having that opportunity to, to work with many across many different uh, disciplines. So again, what a great opportunity for me to to uh, have this opportunity to talk about Lynn and about governing the commons and the impact it has had on research. So I hope the conference goes well. I'm sure it will. We'll all learn many, many things from it and have an opportunity to reflect on those experiences from the past. Thank you so much, Jimmy. And uh, we'll be hearing from um, others and longtime workshoppers, including Bill Blomquist right now, who's kindly chairing uh, panel two for us. So we'll go ahead and just jump right in, again, in the interest of time. Um, so our next panel is entitled Connecting, um, Governing the Commons, and the Broader Themes of Polycentric Governance, chaired by our uh, new director on the Governing the Commons program, senior research fellow, Bl uh, Bill Blumquist, former student of Lynn, of course, a professor of political science and former dean of IUPUI School of Liberal Arts. Um, so Bill, thanks so much for chairing this panel. And um, over to you for the introductions and discussion from there. Yeah, thanks, Scott, and hi, everyone. Um, four terrific panelists. I'm going to be real brief in the introductions. I encourage you to Google them um, because brief introductions don't do justice to uh, all of their scholarship. I'll just introduce them in the order in which they're going to be speaking. So first is Josephine Van Zeven, who is a professor of law and regulation and chair of the law group at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Second is Paul Dragos Alajika, uh, who is Professor of Governance at the University of Bucharest and also a Senior Research Fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Third is Andreas Thiel, who is Professor of International Agriculture Policy and Environmental Governance at the University of Kassel. And fourth is Adela Schlager, who is Professor and Rubidoux Foundation Chair leadership chair at the University of Arizona and also director of the School of Government and Public Policy at the University of Arizona. Each of these terrific colleagues has agreed to speak to this topic from a different angle. Uh, we begin with Dr. Ben Zeven, to whom I'd like to put this question. 
in what ways do you think Lynn's book, Governing the Commons, has influenced other scholars' thinking, perhaps your own, uh, about polycentricity? Thank you so much, Bill, for this introduction and also for pronouncing all our names so so well. I don't envy your 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 job there. Um, it's really a privilege uh, and a pleasure to to speak to everybody about Lynn's work today. Um, so about your question, um, which is almost impossible to answer in 500 minutes, let alone five, um, let me uh, offer a couple of comments to maybe open the discussion on this. So I wanted to highlight uh, two main categories of influence uh, on polycentricity, which I think stem from governing the commons, but also Lynn's work uh, maybe more generally, a substantive one and a methodological one. And I think some of the comments that I'm going to make echo some of the comments already made by the previous panel, but also our keynote speakers. Um, so I hope you'll forgive me for this, but I think they're worth uh, reiterating. Um, so first, I think there's Lynn's substantive focus on self-governance, which we see in governing the commons, which at the time I think was a very clear departure from the models on common pool resource management that dominated uh, social science thinking at the time, and re really relied very heavily still on this idea of imposing an external or top-down planning device for uh, CPR management. Now, people familiar only with governing the commons, which might not be that many, but still, um, may not be aware that Lynn's work is built, of course, on the foundation that she and Vince had already started to lay years before through polycentricity, which you know, itself is so firmly normatively grounded in, their, in its focus on, on self-governance. Now, my, my own road to the workshop was a bit different as far that I first actually studied uh, Vincent's work and only later uh, read Governing the Commons. From, so for me, the sort of overlap and, and relationship between the two was always very self-evident. Lynn's focus on self-governance is based in and on polycentric theory, which I'm sure Paul will speak to in much more detail uh, when, he, when he has his comments on this topic. Um, now, naturally, governing the commons and in turn also influenced polycentric thinking. And I think uh, demonstrating the many successful examples of self-governance with respect to common pool resources is actually, to me at least, was a bit of a turning point in how we had thought about not only common uh, pool resource management, but also by extension polycentric governance. Because making self-governance such a tangible practice rather than an abstract normative ideal, I think has been a really key contribution of governing the commons to polycentricity. Another thing um, that I think uh, substantively Lynn's work very effectively shows is the importance of embedding self-governance within these broader political, economic, and social cultural regimes uh, in order for post-centricity to be sustainable and, and maintained. Now, as a lawyer, and I'm sorry for that, um, I do find that her recognition of the role of rules um, was particularly formative for my thinking on, on polycentricity and, and, uh, and the work generally. Because the recognition that both social norms and formal laws are central in sustaining self-governance and polycentricity has been very important, I think, in the albeit slow recognition um, of uh, polycentric theory as also important in other social science uh, disciplines such as law. Now, I think, an even, I think actually even more interdisciplinary here is needed um, because even though there's this huge range, uh, range of social sciences that are already involved, I think, in the, in, in the workshop and, and its work, um, I think there are still some that we could still learn from. So, for example, I've recently started to bring insights from educational sciences into my own work to better show how, for instance, learning in polycentric theory uh, and learning about public ent entrepreneurial skills and, um, and other things that you need for self-governance uh, um, can, can actually be, be actively thought, taught. So that I, th I thought was an interesting uh, thing that I recently have really been reflecting on. Now, the second issue on, um, on how, um, the second way in which I think Lynn's work influenced uh, polycentricity, I think is really reflected in her views on research methodology. Um, and I think these extend very clearly to polycentricity, something which was also already discussed by Professor McKay Merritt. So Lynn always underlined this dynamic nature of theory and how it, you know, there's an interdependent relationship with, with empirics. Theory and empirics should inform each other through a continuous process of reflection and updating. Now, I think I can speak for many uh, workshops when I say that this really, for me, is a very enduring legacy of Lynn and Vincent's work and very influential also in how I, you know, approach my own work. So to give a tangible example of this, 
Um, when I first came to the workshop, it was for a research project that considered the explanatory power of polycentric governance theory as a model for the European Union. And my additional, additional findings on this suggested that it was a very good fit, you know, and I basically just set out to, to, to do that, to show that fit. But actually, when I started doing this, I found that applying polycentric theory to large governance systems like the EU presented several empirical as well as theoretical challenges. So as a result, the goals of my ongoing research agenda on this um, have moved from just enriching EU scholarship by infusing it with polycentric theory to actually trying to expand on existing poly polycentric theory by providing additional empirical input. So I'm hoping that Lynn would be proud of this little, you know, eureka moment that she that she created for me in this. Um, now, just in closing, in addition to these two categories, I feel like there's a third lesson, uh, which has already also been mentioned from governing the comments, but I feel it cannot be overstated enough. So I think Lynn was very aware of the complexity of the systems that she studied, including also the smaller scale CPR systems that we see in, in governing the comments. And I think she was very clear on where models can provide useful means of abstraction or a metaphor, but also the pitfalls of using these metaphors to then, um, you know, to then as a, as a basis for policy making. And I think these lessons extend very clearly also to polycentric theory, uh, particularly because polycentric systems are in this state of continuous development and therefore do not easily lend themselves to static or inflexible uh, policies or rules. Now, that being said, I think simplification continues to hold great appeal uh, over complexity, both in policy and in scholarship. Um, and I think this for me is really a daily reminder that the work that Lynn and Vincent started is really uh, far from finished. So I'll leave it at that, but thank you very much for your time. Thanks so much, Josephine. Um, next, um, Professor Alajika, please tell us, um, uh, Josephine just talked about how uh, governing the commons influenced her study of polycentricity. Uh, how do you think the Ostrom's ideas about polycentricity affected governing the commons? Paul? Thank you, Bill. Um, it's a real privilege being part of this uh, conversation. So thank you so much for organizing this. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you for participating. Uh, there are several ways in which uh, uh, um, your question could be approached. One of them, which I'm going to take first, is to simply build up on a series of uh, uh, comments made previously, uh, which are pointing out to the broader framework within which we are approaching and understanding the research program captured, expressed in governing the commons. And in fact, restrict, uh, restating briefly the question, uh, the challenge and the question is this, what is the relationship between the two basic major building blocks of the Ostromian contribution to governance theory? The two main building blocks being the theory of polycentricity and the theory of commons, the governance of the commons. And it's important to emphasize this, and we have obviously I'm already emphasized this by uh, organizing uh, by this uh, panel and having this conversation, because usually many people outside of the Ostromian circles are associating in a very narrow way the research program just with the problem of the commons, and within the problem of the commons just with specific findings, insights, results of the Ostromian research program. In fact, the key word here is governance. And the theory of polycentricity and the theory involved in applying and explaining the problem uh, of uh, uh, commons are part of a larger theoretical apparatus and a larger program. If we go back to 2009, Nobel Prize uh, uh, in Economics Committee, it was the year of governance. As we remember, there were two prizes, Oliver Williamson, Eleanor Ostrom, and I'm quoting from the, uh, uh, from the way the committee presented the prizes. So Oliver Williamson, for his analysis of economic governance, especially the boundaries of the firm. Eleanor Ostrom, for her analysis of economic governance, especially the commons. So both the theory of the firm and the governance of commons, where a special emphasis put by the committee while illuminating the larger contribution to the 
research program focused on governance and economic governance. Now, fast forward three months later, when the Nobel Prize winners have to present their address, what is the title of Elinor Ostrom's address? So the title is Beyond Markets and States, right? Polycentric Governance in Complex Economic Systems. And by the way, we see a similar pushback in the case of uh, 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 Williamson, right? He doesn't want to be the nature of the firm guy. He wants to be the transaction cost economics guy, right? So we see from both of them a sort of pushback. Don't look at the especially comma, this and that. Look at our bigger picture, at our contribution to governance theory. And so I think it's important in the context of our conversation to show, to emphasize that the research on the commons is part and parcel of a larger research project out of which the main building blocks are the theory of polycentricity and the theory of governing the commons. But actually it's an open and challenging territory for all of us to further build up the structure and advance the frontiers of that research program by trying to get a better sense of how we could integrate these two facets. What are the relationships between them? What are the insights, methods, approaches that are uniting this paradigm that was advanced by the Ostrom, then which, by the way, was very different from the one advanced based on, uh, on um, transaction cost by Oliver Williamson. So that was my, 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 first, my first reaction, to, 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 to take as a sort of pretext the question and try to emphasize this larger dimension in which governing the commons is part of a larger framework and in which polycentricity is the key conceptual structure sufficiently important that Elinor Ostrom has had to emphasize it in the keynote uh, uh, Nobel address. In the last two minutes, or, uh, I want to give a second interpretation to your, uh, to your question. Again, the question is, Paul, in what ways uh, do you think that Ostrom's ideas about polycentricity affected Lean's analysis of governing the commons under the assumption that there was a sort of um, uh, 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 um, a genealogy we have the polycentricity research project first, and then we have the commons uh, uh, project. And in this respect, I, th I think that it's uh, very important to emphasize the continuity between the two. So I'm going to page now, uh, nine at this point in governing the commons. And there we have the idea that it has already been uh, outlined that uh, um, there is a diversity of institutions out there. It's not just markets and states, right? In order to solve collective action problems, you should have to look to many possible combinations of rules and strategies uh, that people use in order to uh, respond to that challenge. Now, that comes directly from the research on polycentricity, metropolitan governance debate, concept of institutional diversity. You could see the continuity there. You go in metropolitan areas and you discover that actually the, 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 the diversity of institutions and solutions is huge. You could then apply that kind of insights in the context of the research program focused focused on the commons, so institutional diversity. But then at page eight, we have something uh, uh, even more interesting. It's related to that. And uh, again, it's part and parcel of the, the, one of the pillars of governing the commons. And the idea there is this, look, people are not trapped. They are not prisoners, right? They are not prisoners of their own, the mechanics of their own rationality. They are not prisoners of their environment. People could find ways to overcome both the challenges of the mechanics of their rationality and the challenges of the environment or the joint challenges between those two. There is a sort of creativity, there is entrepreneurship in the reactions people have to those challenges. And that is very important because if we are thinking in those terms, we'll try to understand differently the solution space as opposed to trying to frame things in rigid models in which people are the prisoners of this or that structure. Again, this has the origins in the research done on polycentricity, metropolitan governance, and the variety of institutions and solutions that people have been able to put forward uh, responding to those uh, challenges. So there is a continuity there, but there is also a continuity which emphasizes two things, institutional diversity and the human dim dimension. And the human dimension that escapes the standard models of strategic rationality and builds an element of hope, an element of, uh, of humanism, if you want, of creativity, of imagination, 
in the ways we are understanding things. And that connects in the end with a broader intellectual tradition. From time to time, the Austrians have reminded us that actually they are building on a tradition that at least has uh, hopes, if not Aristotle, at their origins. So they are looking to the, to the, to the uh, um, founding fathers, they are looking at Tocqueville, and they are contributing to a tradition of thinking about governance, and it's a sort of evolutionary process of the human mind over history in trying to understand and respond the challenges of governance. So thank you. Oh, sorry. Let, 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 let me let, let me let me stop here and thank you again for for the the privilege of uh, being engaged in this uh, conversation today. Thank you. Well, thank you, and I apologize for for interrupting uh, there. Um, but the, you you ended on a, a point that uh, is a nice bridge to uh, the question I have for uh, Andreas um, about which is also about people creating uh, their their futures. So uh, Andreas, now that Governing the Commons has had 30 years uh, of impact on thinking about common pool resources, um, how do you think polycentricity, polycentric governance should be taken into account when people try to reform common pool resource management towards sustainability? Thanks a lot really, uh, Bill, for organizing this, for having me here. And to be honest, I wouldn't mind just sitting, continuing to sit back and listen to, to Paul and, and Josephine before me. Um, this is just such a pleasure to listen to, to such distinguished scholars and everybody before as well. But nonetheless, you asked me to also um, put in my, my two cents to this topic. And, and I'm certainly, I feel, feel very honored for this, for this opportunity. And I think what I have to say very much resonates with what Josephine and also Paul said and others before, particular Barbara Ellen, and it has been mentioned several times. And maybe in the end, I'll be a bit more daring in coming up with this or that hypothesis and a, a conceptual idea that potentially takes some things further. So I think that when we think about common pool resource management in terms of the kinds of localized examples that Lynn used in governing the commons, then the question you asked me, how do you think polycentric, governing, polycentric governance should be taken into consideration in sustainable common pool resource management, for me, is really about bringing the broader societal and socio-ecological context into the picture. And I'll try to make three brief observations about the mutual relations similar to the previous uh, speakers of polycentric governance, common pool resource management, and, and their study. And the first observation that I would like to make um, is that if we look at polycentric governance as roughly multiple overlapping de facto interdependent decision centers and local common pool resource management, um, then what distinguishes the two is really, most of all, it's been mentioned, I think, already, uh, the question of the scale of analysis. Other than that, both are interested in the conditions that make self-organization sustainable. Um, polycentric governance, nonetheless, encompasses a more complex, a broader set of actors. It includes competition, as already mentioned by Paul, conflict resolution, cooperation into the analysis. While studying common pool resource management, we, we principally focus on cooperation among individuals. So this difference in scale of analysis has huge implications for the complexity of the study uh, that, we, that we undertake under one or the other frame. And it may very well have been for this reason that Lynn decided to first dedicate substantive energy to studying local common pool resource management as a kind of proof of concept of local, uh, of sustainable collective action. And it is also for this reason that much less com consolidated terminology, time, genius has been mobilized to study polycentric governance. And I think in that uh, regard, I really encountered what Josephine also faced when she arrived at the workshop um, some years ago. So there's much more work to be done and, and Paul is one of them and many others here um, that do this work. Um, so the core of the question, Bill, that you put to me is really, I think, why should common pool resource management even care about polycentric governance and its research? 
And obviously, um, all of you would say, well, um, there's design principle seven and there is design principle eight. And I think Adela may well um, elaborate on those two, two aspects. But I do think that these design principles do not really explicitly address the role of what I would call normative, value-driven and well-functioning sustainable polycentric governance. In my view, we therefore need to in fact distinguish between a positive understanding of polycentric governance and a normative understanding of polycentric governance, where checks and balances are in place at the constitutional level that keep self-organization dynamics on a socially de desirable trajectory. And therefore, in my view, the second point about the neck um, that I would like to make, um, often we're overlooking this nexus between normative or sustainable polycentric governance and sustainable common pool resource management. They are, they need to be uh, intricately linked. And Vincent Ostrom, in fact, emphasized this uh, when he talked about uh, the fact that normative polycentric governance could only be sustained if it was present in all spheres of a polity. And I would hypothesize, therefore, that to be sustainable, it is, is an, it is a necessary condition that local common pool resource management was embedded into sustainable normative polycentric governance, as otherwise it would quickly become subject to rent-seeking excessive complexity. So how do we study uh, normative polycentric governance or sustainable polycentric governance? Or what is it in fact? This leads me to a couple of projects that I'm currently engaged with where we think in many different ways about uh, the complexity of polycentric governance, together with Liz Baldwin, Mike McGuinness, Mark Stefan, Sergio, that is here with us on the, on the panel, Elke Kellner, and previously also you, Bill, Dustin Garrick, and I think increasingly um, that normative polycentric governance is best described as a structurally conditioned process quality. So it matters less if governance structures could be described as polycentric or not. Much more importantly, the question is if centers acted under conditions of something like respectful contestation, if they featured public entrepreneurship, learning capabilities, as Claudia already emphasized, if rights to exit voice and self-organizations were present and if actors and, and decision centers had material endowments to engage in polycentric governance. So what we really need to do much more, and Barbara Ellen um, also emphasized this today, and I heard her previously at short uh, exchanges doing the same, we need to much more look at the constitutional and the meta-constitutional underpinnings and capture how these are embodied in process qualities of um, polycentric governance. So therefore, and also to conclude, the study of collective action and local common pool resource management requires, in my view, requires to be nested into the study of what caters to normative sustainable polycentric governance. And I therefore hope, in fact, that at some point in the future, um, and Sergio, for example, and many others alluded to the great capital we have in terms of research program and research design that governing the commons gave us. So I hope that we will be able to diagnose at some point that, that Lynn's governing the commons uh, successfully set our example also for organizing the study of sustainable polycentric governance. And this I think will be necessary indeed and in also, also to have uh, local common pool resource management uh, advance in sustainable manners. So thanks a lot and looking forward to a further exchange. Thanks so much, uh, Andreas. Uh, what great panelists, uh, each sort of handing off to the next, uh, really appreciate it. So uh, Adela, this uh, sets things up nicely for you. Uh, 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 my question for you, the, the design principles, uh, frequently mentioned already today, been among the most cited uh, aspects of governing the commons. Uh, draw the connection, if you would, do you think the design principles have broader applicability to polycentric governance structures? Uh, and if so, how? Yeah, thanks, Bill. And uh, I'm glad that I'm following up on Andreas because he raises a number of uh, critical issues that I think uh, speak to my question as well. Um, one of Lynn's books that I regularly turn to um, is uh, Understanding Institutional Diversity. 
uh, which is just uh, really lays much of the theoretical underpinnings uh, out in a clear and understandable way. And uh, in the final chapter of that book, Institution, Understanding Institutional Diversity, she brings polycentricity together with the design principles. In fact, the title of the chapter is Robust Resource Governance in Polycentric Institutions. And um, I think one of the reasons that uh, you see the two brought together is Lynn understood that highly decentralized uh, systems of CPR governance of these uh, local self-governing arrangements that they um, have limitations. Um, some uh, resource users may fail to organize or self-organization may fail or there might be discrimination among the resource users or there might be conflict among the appropriators and because of these limitations uh, she i think what she lays out in this chapter is that she views polycentricity as a way of addressing the limitations of individualized or individual governance systems and that's clearly, uh, I think, captured in the final design principle uh, entitled Nested Enterprises, in which uh, she says appropriation, provision, monitoring, enforcement, conflict resolution, right, a number of these things are already some of the design principles, that these things and governance activities are organized in multiple layers of nested enterprises. And so, um, you can think of the design principles as providing us with tools or some traction on understanding and explaining robust uh, polycentric systems. But I think um, in order to do that, the design principles have to be thought of as these broad structural features that are shared by robust systems. And I say that because how the design principles are exhibited in local self-governing arrangements are going to be different than how they're exhibited in polycentric systems. And uh, just to give you an example of that, um, in uh, let's say a, a, an irrigation system, farmers, you know, they can walk their canal or they can observe how resource users are behaving, are they complying with the rules and, and whatnot. But if you look at a polycentric system, let's say that it isn't irrigators who are the actors, but it's different jurisdictions who are the actors, it's states or counties, it's irrigation districts. Um, they may not have the opportunity to just simply go and observe how each of them is behaving. Um, in some of my own work on interstate river compacts and uh, governing river systems, what some of the downstream states wanted to do because they were annoyed with the upstream states and how much water was coming to them, they wanted to go into the upstream states and start monitoring and observing on their own. And the upstream states were like, are you kidding me? <laughs> You're not coming into our jurisdiction and taking over our you know, governing activities. And so what monitoring looks like in a setting like that is gonna be really different than in these local um, uh, communities. So that has to be kept in mind. Um, but having said that, I think it's also important to realize that in, or in applying the, the design principles that um, the analyst needs to remain sensitive to the polycentric context and not forget about that context in in using the design principles to try to explain or understand robust polycentric systems. 
So um, in polycentric systems, some of the issues that are critical are, uh, for instance, can, the, can local jurisdictions protect their autonomy from, let's say, central government intrusion as the jurisdictions in the central government are trying to resolve some common pool resource dilemma? Or conversely, can central governments hold local governments accountable for realizing national interests or values without undermining the local government's autonomy? And so um, the, this polycentric context has to be kept in mind in applying and making sense of the design principles to study polycentric systems. Lynn had a really great uh, quote in that final chapter of understanding institutional diversity. Um, she said, governance is frequently an, an adaptive process involving multiple actors at diverse scales. And this is really what's important. Such systems look terribly messy and hard to understand. And I think that the design principles give, an, give analysts uh, a way of making sense of and understanding that messiness. And so I guess um, I would say one way, or I would close with saying that one way to think about the design principles and uh, polycentric governance situations is to think about how do the broad structural features that the design principles represent, how do they support polycentric governance. And I'll stop there. And, and, and I, I, I won't let you answer your own question, but the reason, <laughs> the reason I won't is because we have, uh, because you all have touched off a conversation in the chat. So uh, we have a polycentric technological system here where we have questions through a Q&A box, and we also have people who are posting questions in the chat box. Um, and I'm going to exercise uh, moderator's prerogative to say that there's a question in the Q&A box that is specifically to you, Paul. And so I'm just going to encourage you to go ahead and look at that and type a response yourself. Because of our tight schedule, I'm going to take one of the questions from the chat. And there were a couple of questions that came into the chat box that just sparked all kinds of replies. Uh, I'm just going to choose this one because our schedule is so tight. Um, take the following assertion, uh, which Lynn Ostrom might or might not have agreed with. Uh, polycentricity should not be thought of as a panacea for governance problems. Each of you is going to have to try to tackle that one in a minute. Josephine has already sort of put her hand up in the chat box indicating she's got something to say, so I'm going to go back through our order. Uh, and start at the top with Josephine and hold you each to a quick one minute reply to whether polycentricity is a panacea solution for governance problems. Ready, go. That's a very dangerous um, uh, uh, challenge. Okay, well, I would say that she would not have agreed to that simply because Lynn didn't believe in any panacea, so I very much doubt she would have uh, positioned polycentricity as such. Uh, but also, I think, in, just thinking in my, in my own work, um, so when I started applying it to the EU, I was like, well, actually, I think it could be a solution for many of the things that are wrong um, in the EU. And then actually in applying it, I, I did really find, and this is also where that updating of theory and practice like uh, constantly are reiterating uh, each other, um, that polycentricity is an incredibly rich and powerful uh, device, but it also does create, you know, issues. Like, I think by, by trying to, to make self-governance the, 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 um, the aim of what we're trying to do, there are still other things, and I think power inequalities uh, were already mentioned in the chat, and like other things, they still continue to exist. And it really asks quite a lot of, I think, the people in the system and the system itself to tackle all those things at the same time. So I'm sure that's already more than a minute, so I'll leave it there, but yeah, I, I uh, <laughs> that was my- Thanks, Thanks Josephine. Uh, Paul, you wanna take a shot at this? Yeah, not much to add in, uh, obviously, um, uh, polycentricity. Uh, and the entire research program of the Ostroms is based on functionalist analysis in which structure 
follows the function. So as long as you have a certain type of problem, then you have a certain type of structure which is emerging or should be designed in order to respond to that uh, specific problem. So obviously, the kind of structure that we call polycentricity responds only to a subset of uh, the general set of problems uh, which people are encountering in their uh, um, interactions and in their uh, governing and self-governing uh, situations. So obviously you can't uh, have a conversation about uh, a panacea uh, under the label of polycentricity. Polycentricity itself is a structural reaction to a series of functions that have to be met on the ground by a community or a society. Terrific, thank you, Paul. Andreas? Well, um... Bill, you and I, we've been discussing this at length <laughs> for quite place. some months. And I suspect you, you, you know that I'm, you're, you're quite aware I've got a very similar answer to Paul in terms of certainly needing very much to pay attention to these social problem characteristics, to the particularities of a community and, and how, how diverse, let's say, the aspirations are in relation to particular problem solving issues. I think what is also important in that regard is that um, what what I try to capture as kind of process qualities can will will play out very differently in relation to different issues. So what whatever means respectful contestation, public entrepreneurship, learning capacities, that can be channeled in in, in political and and policy uh, struggles basically um, as much as it can be very uh, taking place more in what we would consider an economic realm um, and and so I think from a positive polycentric analysis positive positive polycentric analysis we try to disentangle that and uh, to some extent both are polycentric um, but um, the question is really um, how what abilities do people have to to affect and mold and 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 get themselves uh, on the agenda with their interests in these different uh, systems i don't think yeah. there's one type of polycentric governance therefore terrific thank you adela uh, you you have the last chance to take the pro panacea position here i don't know <laughs> if you're going to go for it <laughs> tempting but i think not <laughs> um I would pick up on uh, a couple of items that the that some of the prior speakers uh, raised. I think that um, polycentricity is such a general concept in that it exhibits itself in so many different varieties that it isn't a panacea and that um, polycentric systems should be matched to the setting in which uh, they're being used to resolve a problem. But I think also um, getting back to a point that Andreas made, it isn't just the structure, it's also the normative aspect of how our actors interacting, how do they view one another, how do they treat one another. And I think an important issue raised by Barb in her presentation was um, on how polycentricity might be able to um, not force, but encourage a conversation that's larger than maybe any one of the actors wants to have. So in a polycentric system, actors have to account for themselves and for the arguments that they're making, and they can't just talk to the people that they want to talk to. Um, so there's no panacea in any of that. There's a lot of diversity and a lot of interesting research to be done. Cool, thanks. Scott, back to you. Thank you, panelists. No, thanks to all. Thank you, Bill. And how about one more virtual round of applause, at least, <laughs> to our fantastic panelists. Thank you, panel, too. Um, we are obviously running behind schedule, guys. And the main takeaway is that, frankly, we need um, at least an hour for each of these amazing discussions. So hopefully, this just kind of whets your appetite for further you know, dialogue and virtual conferences, but also again, hopefully, you know, in-person conferences, perhaps later in 2021, if we're lucky. Um, so without further ado, we're gonna go on to our next uh, video testimonial. And I hope you're not tired of Bill, because uh, it looks like uh, we have another one coming up, testimonial for you, Bill. Uh, but first, um, Adela, I hope you're also not tired of Adela. Sorry, got the order on there. Um, so Adela, thanks again for recording this testimonial for us. Just as a reminder, um, Adela is, of course, 
um, uh, the director and Melody uh, Romano Foundation found, uh, Fund Leadership Chair at Arizona State University and his Senior workshop, workshop Fellow and member of our External Advisory Board um, at the workshop. So let's hear Adela's video testimonial, then we'll go right on to panel three. Greetings from Tucson, Arizona. My name is Adela Schlager and I'm the Director of the School of Government and Public Policy at the University of Arizona. I received my PhD in political science in 1990 from Indiana University, where I had worked with Lynn Ostrom in the workshop for four years. And this is my brief take on what it was like at the workshop when Governing the Commons was written. The first thing that you need to realize about the workshop was what a dynamic and exciting place it was. Vincent and Lynn were teaching their PhD seminars, and it wasn't just students involved in those seminars, but it was all of the visiting scholars from around the world who would also participate and engage in discussions and debates. And there were the Monday colloquia in which scholars would be invited in to present uh, the research that they were working on. And so we had Bob Netting who worked on the Swiss Alps and we had Pickford Berkeys who worked on coastal fisheries and their work appeared in Governing the Commons. So within this dynamic organization, there was this really large and complex research project on common coal resources. And it had a lot of different moving parts. The graduate students, me and Yan Tang and Bill Bloomquist were working on developing coding forms and coding case studies on fisheries and irrigation systems and groundwater systems. And Julie England was supporting us with a, a database. And Lynn worked with two fabulous economists, Roy Gardner, a game theorist, and Jimmy Walker, an experimentalist. And they were doing formal modeling of CPR settings and working on the CPR experiments. And then all of us were working together to try to figure out and develop a theory of common pool resources to try to explain why would resource users engage in collective action to sustainably govern their resources. It was an exciting and dynamic time. So this is the context in which Governing the Commons was written. Now, Governing the Commons is best known for chapter three and the design principles. But at the time, what was really driving us and what Lynn was really engaged in was the first two chapters, the theory chapters, trying to explain uh, a theory of collective action in relation to common pool resources. So Governing the Commons was published in 1990. Four years later, Rules, Games, and Common Pool Resources was published, and it laid out the full research program. You can think of it as the sequel to Governing the Commons. And I would encourage you to pick up both volumes and read both of them. Governing the Commons was and is a critically important volume. It lays out an initial theory and of CPRs and self-governance of CPRs, but it also importantly was the first fruits of a large scale important research program that produced so much and that continues to motivate multiple research programs. At the time, we really didn't know that governing the commons was going to be as important as it was. We just worked hard, we had fun, and we had an amazing leader, Lynn, who mentored us and guided us through it. And to this day, I still miss her. Thank you so much. From that was fantastic <laughs> on many counts. And I have to apologize as well. In my haste to get through your uh, kind of the brief intro to you there, I said Arizona State. So completely my fault, of course, University of Arizona. That, that of course, would be the only thing people remember. But no, <laughs> that was a fantastic video. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for doing that. No, that, that, was, that was lovely. Um, and uh, we'll move on right now. Uh, and apologize again for, for kind of the haste between these transitions, but we're just trying to pack in as much as possible given the multiple time zones to panel three, um, chaired by our very own Barbara, Barbara Allen, 
And the title of this uh, panel will be Governing the Commons and the New Commons, Public Health, Cybersecurity, Urban Spaces, and Knowledge Commons. As Edu already very ably introduced you, Barb, of course, longtime workshopper, um, a former student, uh, and uh, the James Woodward uh, Strong Professor of Political Science and Liberal Arts at Carleton. And I will give you one quick plug, winner of the American Politics Group 2019 Richard E. Neustadt Book Prize in London for her uh, book, Truth and Advertising Lies and Political Advertising and How They Affect the Electorate, uh, which co-authored, of course, with Daniel Stevens. And boy, uh, do we need uh, that type of analysis right now. So thank you so much, Barb, and over to you for panel three. Thank you, and thank you all for joining us on this exciting panel. Um, I will move right ahead and let you know that I will post some email addresses at the end of our talk if time permits. But our idea is to talk about lessons from governing the commons that were most useful in understanding various new commons and also thinking about new commons, what might change or be expanded or extended from governing the commons. The first speaker we have is Mike McGinnis, who's senior research fellow at the Ostrom Workshop. And he's going to talk about the principles for infrastructure design, health commons, and polycentric governance. So Mike, please take it away. Thank you very much, Barbara. It's a real pleasure to see all these friendly faces. Uh, and to participate in this, uh, this conference. The new, the new commons that I've been investigating is the health commons, which I interpret as encompassing public health, medical care, health insurance, public assistance programs, and anything else to do with health policy in the US. Uh, what I most learned from governing the commons concerns Lynn's design principles, but I now interpret them in a way that Lynn may not have intended, and that is definitely not the way many subsequent researchers may have used these principles, and that may slip into the panacea problem that uh, was brought up uh, at the end of the last panel. That, that's, that's an addition. Uh, most of us see the design principles as guidelines summarizing how communities can sustainably manage a common pool resource. So by applying these principles to natural resource commons, um, Lynn made it too easy for us to miss the critical importance of the technological and rule-based infrastructure that provides individuals groups and collective actors access to pools of common resources and public goods they share in common. The design principles don't say anything about the nature of the good. They're all about the nature of the common property regime in place that sets limits on permitted, required, and prohibited uses of uh, use, prohibited forms of resource extraction and use and contributions to infrastructure maintenance. But now infrastructure, I'm using pretty broadly to include both the technological opportunities made possible by available technology and the rules which specify which technical tools can and cannot be used in different circumstances and which policy instruments available in that political system are deemed appropriate for changing those rules. If properly crafted and effectively enforced, these rules and restrictions should help ensure that shared resources will be extracted in ways and at levels of utilization that when taken in a whole, will neither deplete nor irreparably degrade the underlying pool uh, opportunity. But since technical and policy-based infrastructures are so different in different, different resource regimes, it's not easy to see infrastructure as absolutely critical to all forms of commons governance. In an irrigation system, no one could overlook the construction and never-ending task of maintaining the dams, channels, and other parts of the infrastructure. But for fisheries, you might overlook the tools used by fishermen or forget the norms and rules that limit how many fish can be extracted, by whom and when, and what feasible fishing methods are prohibited. In short, to sustain a commons, the infrastructure itself has to be sustainable and different principles will be needed to help sustain different infrastructure. Well, this seems obvious to me now, but I got here by a very roundabout path through a long process of agonizing over what the term health commons might mean. Two years before she died, Lynn set up a working group investigating the question of whether commons research had any lessons for potential reforms to US healthcare. I was very lucky to be included in that working group. We started by debating which aspects of healthcare, health promotion, or health insurance were common property uh, resources, or excuse me, common pool resources, or public goods, or tool goods, or private goods, et cetera. 
all that was a dead end because all of these types of goods and services need to be considered in any comprehensive analysis of the health commons and what it might mean or whatever it might mean. Later, I shifted my attention to specific programs of medical care, public health, health insurance, public assistance, health technology, et cetera, et cetera. Each program could be seen as a mini commons constructed, operated, and maintained by the collaborative efforts of health professionals, public officials, corporate and community leaders, and patients, and their caregivers and advocates. Anyone involved in implementing or benefiting from that program. I'm still trying to work out how, how all these mini infrastructures connect together to construct the health commons as it currently exists and whether or not Ostromian modes of institutional analysis might help us determine how that system might best be reformed. Uh, I hope to write a book on that, but you're all gonna have to wait a while till I get to the end of that project. But if the system of medical technologies and policy programs related to health care in health insurance, health, health promotion, constitutes an infrastructure of resources upon which patients can draw to improve their own health or to improve the health of their communities, or unfortunately to act in ways that contribute to the ill health of others, then what does this imply for the broader foundation of political, economic, legal order in society as a whole? That is the system of polycentric governance in which specific instances of collective action are embedded as has been uh, noted by several of the participants in this panel already. I think we can say that polycentric governance is itself a commons, a widely shared infrastructure providing individuals, groups, and corporate actors access to all the kinds of resources relevant for self-organization, political activism, or any other form of collective problem solving. We can't all have equal access to the many kinds of resources in that governance infrastructure, nor can we expect to experience equally satisfactory health outcomes. But in governing the commons, Lid did demonstrate that the rules determining differential access to shared resources should be responsible and fair as determined by social, the social values shared among its users. Since infrastructure supporting any kind of commons requires maintenance, Who's responsible for maintaining the sustainability of a health commons or ensuring the continued integrity of an infrastructure of polycentric governance? The short answer is we all are. And frankly, here in the US, we need to start doing a better job of both. Thanks. I look forward to your comments. Thank you, Dr. Fantastic. I think I'm up next. Is that right, Barb? Yes, Scott is Scott Shackelford is next and he's going to talk with us today about his experience using the governing the commons design principles to understand the current state of global commons governance. And Scott is an expert on cybersecurity. So take it away, Scott. Hey, no, thank you so much, Barb. And thank you. It was fantastic. Um, Mike, already, you're always a tough uh, act to follow. I have two quick goals for my you know, brief five minutes of fame here to highlight first off several opportunities. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't to get more involved in the workshop generally and then in some of our work on internet governance and cybersecurity knowledge commons in particular. And then to talk about a recent work that builds frankly pretty directly from the uh, groundwork that Lynn laid out in governing the commons. So first for opportunities, uh, if it's been a while since you've checked out a few of the things we have going on, just put in a chat uh, link to the chat box there. We have a lot of working groups on the topics both in this panel and more broadly, such as urban commons, as well as you know, property rights, law and economics, blockchain, even space governance, um, as well as visiting scholar opportunities, which we're doing virtually now, of course, but again, we hope to do in person in the relatively near future, seed funding opportunities. There's a new uh, a GROW podcast, the Governance Roundtable of the Ostrom Workshop, that we'd love to feature you and your work to help kind of get out the word and build community. We'd love to even do kind of an audio postcard, so kind of notes from the field series, if you'd like to participate in that. We're also launching a new Ostrom Book Club um, that we're gonna be launching with Lita Amsler later in October. So if you have a recent book that really builds from uh, the Ostroms and the workshop literature, let us know. We'd love to have it featured as part of the book club series and the Wednesday research series. 
We're also trying to formalize ties, frankly, with a lot of institutions right now that we've done work with historically, as well as some strategic opportunities going forward. We've already done that with Australia National University. We're in the process now of doing it with King's College. Um, similarly, if you're aware of institutions where it might make sense to kind of formalize ties with the workshop in IU, feel free to reach out. We'd love to have those conversations. Um, as far as opportunities directly in cyber and internet governance, we have a very active cyber peace working group. Uh, we have a new edited volume coming out with Cambridge University Press next year that a lot of these affiliates and as well as some practitioners and policymakers were involved with. That edited volume is cyber peace, starting a path toward a sustainable, stable, and secure cyberspace. Um, and there's a lot of uh, direct linkages there to polycentricity that I'll say more about in just a second. Also a lot of work these days on digital repression and election security. We're co-hosting a series of events with our College of Arts and Sciences, which now has a democracy themester this fall. Um, so I'll put up a link there in just a second to some of those events, but we have panel discussions, even a special talk by IU's president, uh, Michael McRobbie, who co-chaired the uh, Securing the Vote report as part of the National Academies uh, Committee. And then finally, we're trying to do a lot in the applied realm. As many of our speakers have highlighted, that's long been in the DNA of the workshop. So not only in the realm of new clinical opportunities and policy labs, helping local governments out more broadly, but we'd love to kind of spread awareness and network these opportunities. Already some universities have, have been reaching out, even earlier this week, the University of Alabama reached out because they're trying to launch their own um, cybersecurity clinic, for example. We're working with Berkeley as well. So if you have opportunities or you're aware of ways that we can connect and work together to help kind of uh, not only in this case, protect local governments from the likes of ransomware, but also more generally be a policy lab, right? To distill our findings down for policymakers, we'd love, we'd love to be part of that conversation. Now onto my very brief remarks about, about this book that I promised. Um, so this builds from a, uh, a book that's called Governing New Frontiers in the Information Age uh, Toward Cyber Peace that I published with uh, Cambridge Press a few months ago. It's frankly an homage to governing the commons in a lot of ways. In fact, I asked Cambridge if I could just shorten the title to Governing the Global Commons. They did not go for it. I don't have nearly the cachet that Lynn did with publishers, clearly. Uh, but it's a critical time uh, to study this issue since we're seeing enclosure, as so many speakers have highlighted, and as many of you I'm sure are aware already, across so many of these frontiers, from cyber sovereignty to the encroachment of the deep seabed to even space, with a case in point being the removal of common language from a lot of US government policies, including DOD strategies related to cybersecurity and accessing space, right? So how we think of the global commons now from a policymaker lens is very different than it was even five or 10 years ago. The book itself was quite a journey. It actually started while I was an undergrad at IU studying economics and political science. I was and am a bit of a sci-fi uh, nerd and was interested in studying at that point the 2002 NASA vision for space exploration and what it meant for space governance. I wound up sticking my head further in the clouds and expanded on this work for my MPhil at uh, Cambridge which compared and contrasted the space commons with other global commons arenas, in particular the deep seabed and Antarctica. Inevitably, this line of research led me to Lynn's work generally and governing uh, the commons in particular. In fact, I had the honor of joining IU's faculty while I was still completing my PhD in politics and international studies. And one of the first things I did when I got to Bloomington was reach out to Lynn. And this was 2010. She just recently won the Nobel Prize, but she responded to my cold email the same day and agreed to critique several chapters of my dissertation, which is just the kind of person and scholar that Lynn was, as you've heard today, and is truly remains an inspiration to all of us. Um, Lynn's input was vital, along with many others featured today, including Dan Cole, Mike McGinnis, and plenty of others on versions and parts of this, uh, of this book project. I make use of a lot of uh, literatures uh, that we've talked about, including polycentric governance, as we think about the next phase of kind of global commons governance, since leaders across so many fields have proffered this as an ideal solution, sometimes a bit tongue in cheek with the likes of Russia, for example, preferring a polycentric approach to internet governance. But by that, they mean not Western dominated, uh, much more multilateral, uh, which kind of gets us into the critiques and the sustainability of this concept, as Mike kind of pointed out in our colloquium series and at Della, as you did so ably as well. I also try to draw connections between how each arena of the global commons has evolved in response to a variety of variables, including technological advancement, resource scarcity, multipolar politics, building from the design principles and the evaluation criteria of the IED framework. 
Now, not all of these resonate equally in these contexts. Boundaries, of course, can be difficult to draw, et cetera. And I'd be happy to talk more about the design principles in particular um, during the Q&A to follow as well as offline. But there's a lot of important um, uh, takeaways from each of these domains. So I try to explore each in turn and import lessons as we think about internet governance. I'll just highlight one. So for example, there's a chapter on climate and comparing it to internet governance. We really try to dig into the Paris process in particular, since it was a framework to catalyze bottom-up action in a lot of ways. And I did some interviews for that chapter, including with Jonathan Pershing, who was the former US Special Envoy on Climate Change. And he argued that instead of a pure global commons approach, individual nations managed their own emissions through the Paris Accord, which was a hybrid, and negotiators didn't collectively agree to an outcome and bring it back home. They agreed at home and brought it to the international community, which was a key reason um, that past F that the, the Paris was frankly a lot more successful than past efforts and has remained so durable despite, frankly, kind of the US government's intransigence over the last few years. So I try to get some lessons there for how that same process of kind of bottom up, uh, kind of bilateral and regional pledges can build toward addressing global collective action problems in the cyber context, but as well as the oceans and space, and then more generally. I lastly try to do some work on reformulating legal concepts like the common heritage of mankind concept to be more in line with modern sustainable development parlance and the goals for the sustainable development uh, goals in particular, as well as looking some, at some new technologies like blockchain to help foster more sustainable and peaceful use of global common pool resources. Um, I end this 200,000 word tome and it, is, it very much is a tome on a bit of an optimistic note uh, with a quote from Charles Kettinger who said, uh, where there's an open mind, there'll always be a frontier. And I kind of like that pragmatic streak. I think it echoes well with Lynn's philosophy as well, um, to never let the great be the enemy of the good, and that we should always be looking ahead and making progress on these, you know, what can be frankly pretty daunting challenges. So thank you so much. I'll stop there, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Very nice. Thank you, Scott. And thank you for giving us some indications of the polycentric infrastructure that is the workshop. Next, Amy Potit, who is co-director of the Loyola Sustainability Research Center at Concordia University in Montreal, shares her insights on reclaimed commons in urban settings. And she's going to focus particularly on the process of commoning, using that idea as a verb, as somewhat distinct from our focus on the commons, a noun. Amy? Yes, thank you. First of all, I'd like to say I'm really delighted to be part of this celebration of governing the commons, to see so many familiar faces, new faces, um, and to have this conversation. So the topic I was given um, was originally just urban commons in general, and I want to start by um, emphasizing that urban commons are wildly diverse. You could think of, for instance, community gardens. You can think about alleys that are converted by neighbors into green spaces spaces for children to play, for collective activities. You could think about empty lots or other wasteland, so-called wasteland, where people um, develop shortcuts or they um, plant gorilla, they engage in gorilla gardening. They might be taking um, driving lessons, um, setting up cultural displays, whether they be for holidays or art installations, play sports and so forth. Or you can think about abandoned industrial buildings and sites that have been um, reclaimed as markets or informal parks, community gardens, sites for community events, again, art installations, and many other purposes. My focus is on the, um, the post-industrial sites. If we look at post-industrial sites from the perspective of governing the commons, we see that there are many challenges for collective action. The, um, this, this is something that Harini has alluded to a few times in her comments earlier, the openness of cities. Um, among other things, when we talk about openness of cities, we're talking about um, communities that are overlapping unclearly, the, the boundaries are not defined, they're fluid, di they're dynamic. And you have many diverse people with different interests. Such sites have been described by Amanda Curran as being saturated, saturated with people, with uses, with values, with interest, with investments. Um, there typically is a lack of a legal status for the commoning activities, or there's an unclear legal status, which increases the risk that whatever is taking place in terms of establishing and maintaining an urban commons 
is at risk of um, interventions that are destructive of them. These sites are oftentimes targets of renewal or redevelopment by local authorities or investors that may undermine or destroy what local people have been doing. And here I'm using local, so it's not local in an urban setting is um, a bit more um, maybe fraught, but let's say more bottom up dynamics. Given the social fluidity and the dynamism of such sites, we cannot assume that we're going to see the repeated interactions, the trust, the sort of well-defined communities where you have shared understandings of what's valuable about these sites, what should be happening there. But on the other hand, as Glenn argued in Governing the Commons, we should not assume the absence either. And this is where we get into the idea of commonness. Um, Harini also noted that when we're talking about urban commons, that they're not necessarily enduring, uh, which is consistent with them not adhering to many of the um, design principles. But they are recurring. It seems to me that we're constantly having people engaging in commoning activity. For me, the urban commons draw attention precisely to commoning as a verb which refers to practices to sustain shared access to and care for resources and space. By working together to maintain access to and care for the resources and space, commoning involves the generation and regeneration of shared understandings, the generation and regeneration of trust, of social capital. It generates a sense of belonging to a community of others that have a shared concern are engaging in a shared care of some space, some resources, some infrastructure. So it's a, a belonging to that community, a belonging to the commons, as well as the commons belonging to this community. So if we again compare this idea of commoning as a verb to the themes that we see in governing the commons or more ge generally in Lynn's work, there are some points of com compatibility and some points of, let's say, differences in emphasis. Um, in Governing the Commons and elsewhere in Lynn's work, she emphasized institutional development very, very, very clearly. She is um, one of the landmark contributors to the new institutionalism. Commoning is not necessarily so focused on institutions as on practices, so there is a, a difference of orientation or emphasis there. But Lynn also, throughout her work, emphasized trust and social capital, um, the psychology, again, of having shared understandings, the dynamism of social interactions. So there, there are some points of, of contact compatibility. There's also another shift, though, which is important and that I would like to emphasize. This is the shift from evaluating the implications of various levels of trust and social capital for institutional development, for governing the commons, to thinking about processes that support commoning and thus support the possibilities for increasing interactions, building trust, building social capital, developing systems for governing the commons, as well as processes and situations that hinder commoning. So what this does by instead of thinking about the commons as something that is there and that we are collectively trying to govern, but thinking about governing as the process of creating this thing that we call the commons as a, as a process, as an ongoing experience, is it opens the door to thinking about the situation from a more activist approach, a more um, proactive approach. There, to me, I see in urban settings um, a very widespread insight to create and participate in commons. Commoning may not be universal, but it is pervasive, it's widespread. And if we are thinking about commoning as practices, that there may be um, particular practices that are consistently or very, very frequently um, successful in fostering commoning, then these are things that we want to share and that we want to in indeed support. So that's the note that I will end on, thank you. Thank you, Amy. We now turn to Angie Raymond, who brings her experience in business law and ethics in her work at the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University to questions of data trusts in healthcare and smart cities, which is a very timely topic in a time of pandemic. 
Angie? Thank you, Barb. Um, first, I'd like to say I'm going to build on uh, something that was just mentioned a few moments ago by Mike McGinnis. In many ways, we're beginning to develop the concept of new commons within these areas. And so the conversations about how the commons uh, can inform our decision making, but also areas that we might need to diverge are very interesting and a very hot topic right now. Therefore, I'm not going to speak about one single project in detail. I'm instead going to speak about a series of interrelated projects focusing on that broad area often thought of as smart cities. First, it's important to recognize the phrase smart cities has become a hot topic, but cities really aren't smart, and frankly, neither is the tech. I like thinking of connected communities designed with the goal of people using data to make better decisions about and within their communities. Second, tech deployments and rushing to buy the newest flashy tech has been a goal of many cities as they attempt to be as smart as their neighbors. I find this a disastrous goal without any guardrails at all. Finally, many governments are struggling under the decision-making surrounding tech deployments, often with few people on the ground to actually think through good governance. These perceptions form the backbone of the approach taken in a very directed research stream in smart cities. The first work in this vein a Commons Approach to Smart Cities data, data Governance, How Eleanor Ostrom Can Make Cities Smarter, authored and published by our frequent collaborator, New America, is a great first step, yet more work needs to be done. First, many governments embraced open government and open data initiatives, noble goals, but transparency of government is not the same as open via data dumps. Governments are often ill-equipped to set up guardrails for decision-making in terms of data, and its releases, and frankly have yet to truly even consider aggregated data and its harms. With affiliated scholar Ina Cooper, we are examining data in open government environments to think through both the privacy harms, but also the structures to promote data sharing with an eye toward its impacts and harms from aggregation. Similarly, Luddy researcher Hilda Hayden, supervised by Jean Camp and Samir Patel, are about to launch research examining the perception and trust aspects of citizens in the government data gathering and sharing. She will build upon prior research we completed in this area to assist us in understanding the bounds of trust and the limits expected from the citizens. In addition, we are working with several larger cities to assist in matching community needs and wants with the government's needs and wants. Often local governments use data, such as crime rates, to target key areas and or communities, but these efforts in today's flashy tech world are often reduced to merely deploying more tech to further surveil citizens. We are researching on the ground what citizens want and need to think of tech as even part of the solution. By matching the two main stakeholders perception needs and wants, we hope to foster greater trust within these communities. Of course, no community is smart if it forgets the need to be sustainable and environmentally conscientious. We work with several partners on the IU campus, such as Gary Motz at the Geological and Water Survey, to ensure the science community builds research communities of cooperation in these key areas. We help scientists think through licensing and data sharing, while creating data sharing cooperatives and mesonets to assist in broad data sharing by visualizations and research vital to environmental sustainability. In the same vein, we hope to soon announce a formal plan to train the data scientists and managers of the future. By launching an education program and clinic to train students, engage faculty, and build knowledge for the communities most in need, especially those public institutions. Building on the success of the cyber program, we will assist public institutions in bringing research and data into the decision-making environment, while never sacrificing community needs and demands for privacy. In healthcare, a large portion of citizens fail to have access to health care they need. Unfortunately, this is often because of issues of payments and access to information. We have been working with partners such as Greg Bloom to help eliminate barriers to basic information amongst community social services. While we, both, while we work with large health data trust communities to ensure the necessary data is both available and shared in a manner that protects privacy, but ensures access to essential life-saving services and resources. In this vein, we will soon announce a Data Trust Salon series. In conjunction with Kim Hauser and others from around the world, experts of the area will lead discussions about their passion with data trusts and the importance of this device in making all of these systems work. 
And finally, while we are working with several groups of students from Maurer, Kelly, and Luddy, and our wonderful partners at the Indiana Courts, such as Bob Rath of the Supreme Court and Marilyn Smith and Katie Guerrero at the Indiana Bar Foundation, to ensure more people have better access to the vast area of judicial services, essential services as cities move more of our lives into the digital world. I could not simply describe one project. This interconnected group of research and scholars form the backbone of groundbreaking research being done at, in conjunction with, and supported by IU and the Ostrom Workshop. These all, in slightly different but overlapping ways, build upon the prior work of the workshop, which I'm incredibly grateful for. Just one final note, all of these projects have working groups, host conferences, virtual meetings, salon series, and frankly, a ton of opportunities, all that are being managed right now virtually, because unfortunately, you can't visit us in the fall-like environment of Bloomington. But I would very much like to hear from all of you and get you more involved. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Um, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, I have tried to pull a few together to ask some synoptic questions, and I think I'll ask them in pairs so you can respond to each other. Um, first, Amy and Mike, one of the things that some of our um, audience would like to hear more about is what methods we might have for distinguishing rules and norms on the one hand from processes such as commoning and governance on the other hand. I will tack on, can these be separated in terms of our methods? Do we want to separate them? How can we think of common zing and the commons together, but how can we understand these phenomena as distinct? Amy, you wanna start? Okay, yeah, I can, I can start. Um, for me, I see these as being um, intertwined, but indeed distinct in that the, the practices, practices can become institutionalized, but they aren't necessarily institutionalized. Um, so that's one thing. Um, with that, when I think about practices and processes, I'm thinking about um, dynamics that are themselves changing situations in some respects and they can in, in among other things they can change the, the institutions that are in place um, whether they be formally or informally um, they can also changes in interpretations um, so this is another thing but the other thing i'm thinking about with um, the practices of commenting in particular is when we're thinking about urban um, commons such as um, the one behind me <laughs> in, my, in my background, um, we're talking about spaces where you have many different groups that are engaging in commoning at the same time. So they may, um, they may not be, or individuals too, they, they may be engaging in commoning, engaging in, in care for the site um, in, in ways. Uh, so for instance, in, in this site, there's um, an individual I see frequently who doesn't seem to be part of any organization who is in there pruning things. Um, but people see him pruning things, and so we, we, we see that there is this individual who is caring for the site. And even though there's not necessarily an institution involved, there's a communication and there's a, um, a dynamic that's going on there where there is a signaling of this is a site that is to be cared for and that individuals can take initiative to care for things. There are also frequently in this particular site people who put up art ins installations. So it's a different kind of care because they are um, they are engaging in creativity and creative expression. Um, some of these um, some of these are really quite modest. Uh, there's a there's a stick in one place where somebody has put first a flower, um, an artificial flower, and then some other people added um, dried flowers that had been cut from the site, and then somebody else added some sequin something. So it becomes um, um, interesting because people are engaging in, in interactions with each other, but they're engaging in interactions in a way that is rather fluid and doesn't necessarily involve direct contact. Um, this becomes especially interesting in the current time, you know, when it's difficult to get people to come together in, in person and to think and even talk about what do we want to have as our rules. So sometimes these rules are, so rules may well develop, 
Um, monitoring is very, very difficult. You know, another thing that happens, there's a, a wall or there's a murals that have been painted. Um, recently, there were some graffiti people who came and destroyed the whole thing. And I'm thinking, well, it really would be lovely to find out who did this and punish them because they have destroyed these wonderful murals that have been collectively um, generated. Um, in that particular case, it's really difficult to think about how do you monitor um, folks who come in probably, probably at the night and, and um, engage in that sort of destruct, you know, they're, they're, they're reclaiming it for themselves which points to the, the fact that um, commoning can be competitive. It, it doesn't necessarily lead to, this gets to the issue of um, contestation being there and some of the, the challenges of setting up these things. I'm not sure I'm really um, answering the question directly, but I am making some reflections about um, how these processes have themselves a fluidity to them, and yet at the same time they can contribute to um, patterns of network building um, and, and communication that might not be face-to-face -face communication that can give rise to especially informal uh, rules and institutions that, um, you know, like that. So I'll leave it at that because uh, I, I, don't, I don't have an excellent answer for this. I'm just giving some thoughts. Thank you. It was excellent. Excellent thinking. Thank you. Mike, do you have a couple of um, really brief responses? A couple, couple comments. I thought Amy did a really good job on that too, and sorry about passing the buck to you there. Uh, but um, I wish I had used the word commenting in my, in my talk, frankly, when, when you put it together. Because really when I talked about infrastructure maintenance, it's a form of commenting. It, it's maintaining access to shared resources. And uh, the word commenting gives it sort of a personal uh, connection, uh, infrastructure maintenance is a, is a wee bit uh, off-putting, I think. Uh, but that's exactly what I was talking about and exactly what I think we're pretty poor at in terms of maintaining our governance systems right now at the macro level. Uh, and our election campaign now is just a, you know, a total mess. Uh, but what you're looking at at this local level is there's still these, 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 very, these very active efforts to try to maintain access of various kinds. And just one other quick point I want to make, and, and, and Andreas may, may find this familiar too, because we're working on a paper where we're, we're kind of developing this argument. Um, at the very macro level, looking at what a polycentric governance is, I, I think it's a real mistake to just look at them as polycentricity as a structural definition. It's, if it's going to be persisted over time and be sustainable, the structural conditions have to provide the foundation for processes that generate the kinds of outcomes that maintain those structural conditions and make it possible for those processes to continue. So the interaction between institutions, rules, norms, processes, behaviors, commoning are fundamentally intertwined in an endogenous process uh, in a way that, that makes it difficult to apply sort of standard hypotheses of, of you know, if the X then Y kind of thing. And, exactly the kind of institutional analysis that, that Lynn was so good at and that um, our first speaker today um, uh, uh, really emphasized, um, um, uh, forgetting her name now, oh, sure, Bonnie McCoy, McCoy okay, uh, really emphasized this thin rationale, thin modeling versus a more thick sort of process. There, this commoning and, and governance are, you know, very tightly related. So that's how I would react. Thank you. We have um, just very, very limited time. And I have a question for Scott and for Angie. Um, this has been raised in our chat in a couple of different ways. Could you reflect very, very briefly on the linking of global and local commons? There are some questions that are specifically about climate change. Take it up if you wish. There are also a set of questions that have to do with the diversity of institutions, the diversity of persons, the diversity of settings. And maybe to think about whether when we consider diversity and inequality, is it diversity and inequality at the global level? Is it diversity and difference at the global level? How do those work together? Hoping that's not too abstract. It's a big question. Brief comments. Perfect. Angie, you want to start or I'm happy to? Either way. Go for it. Please, please go. Oh, okay. All right. Sure. Okay. 
Yeah, no, so uh, so just in brief, you're, I think you're absolutely right um, to kind of point out those differences and they're vital. Um, I'm, Lynn would be the first to say, right, including in her work on the climate change context for that World Bank report and otherwise that, you know, not all these lessons, frankly, populate very well when we're looking at these global common poor resources. The design principles need to reflect that. Um, so I tried to build on and frankly stand on the shoulders of giants a little bit, you know, in this book to try to do some of that, but clearly we need a lot more um, the equivalent of field work, basically, uh, as well as more robust regime effectiveness studies to learn about, you know, which of these regimes are working quite well. As Gustavo pointed out there in the chat, there's a lot of legitimate criticisms about the Paris process. Uh, we're not meeting these goals. Is it enough, right? But also, I would just encourage us to think about what the alternatives are, right? And there's a reason this was you know, basically the fastest climate agreement to get to basically universal ratification, whereas Kyoto took, you know, far longer and didn't achieve nearly as much even as the Montreal Protocol. So happy to, happy to chat more about that. But the only other kind of quick reflection would be you brought up the um, kind of diversity and equity angle there. And I, I really like this concept of common but differentiated responsibilities and how it's playing out in different realms of global commons governance. So I try to play with that in particular in not only the climate context here, but look to see how we can you know, promote different realms of, and ideas of you know, the no harm principle or due diligence, taking into account these different resource endowments, as well as concerns about you know, both equity right here and now, as well as intergenerational inter equity, which was kind of built into that common heritage concept, which has since kind of fallen by the wayside. So I'm kind of wondering how we can kind of uh, resuscitate some of those conversations as part of the sustainability movement. So I'll, that was too long, so apologies. <laughs> I'll be really quick because, um, so our primary focus is data, which is sort of odd um, and I, I, in some context. So we are in fact struggling with this very much of how, how large the conversation should occur because data, you know, in the same way, or I make the analogy all the time as data in the same way as air, uh, you know, might be here today, but it's over there tomorrow. And it has incredible impacts on wherever it is at the time. Um, but we have a different structure, right? It's very different to have a conversation uh, that hopefully a lot of us can agree, maybe not everyone, can agree that we want air and we'd like it to be clean and or reasonably, you know, capable of sustaining us. Data is different and it's causing us to have more than a couple of moments of pause about what that means. And so we are trying to draw upon the analogy and some of my early stuff really did draw upon the, the climate change and those conversations. But pretty quickly we're moving away and realizing that that might not be the best analogy um, to think of these things. But the, you know, the, the fact that the Americans for the most part commercialize data and now it's hard to put that genie back in the bottle is a different conversation than, than us you know, all committing to taking a different approach to you know, cars that belch emissions that are going to cause us long-term standard changes. Um, so there's this impetus of people being reasonably happy with the commercialization of data because it allows us to have much cheaper software and applications. And that, that push-pull is an interesting add-on to the conversation. So I don't think I have an answer yet, uh, which one's gonna win out the day. I fear it's gonna be local. And then, you know, for the context of the United States, it's gonna be very much a commercial entity, uh, which is gonna to totally change the conversation because lots of the rest of the world doesn't think of it that way. I also couldn't do it in a minute, but I tried, <laughs> sorry. Excellent. Well, I've enjoyed working with all of you and we have more questions and not enough time. It has been a very rich conversation. I am quickly putting up for everyone the email addresses of these wonderful panelists and I do encourage you to write and thank you so much. Thanks, Barb. Thank you, thank you Barb. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Barb. And no, well done. Well done, everybody. Again, there's so much to talk about. And unfortunately, um, too little time, but at least we're covering a lot of ground. Um, so last but not uh, least, we have our final testimonial, and then we'll move on to our final panel. Um, Bill uh, had recorded the next testimonial for us. Uh, and over to virtually you, Bill. Thank you. When I think about the uh, impact of governing the commons over the last 30 years, uh, the word that comes to mind is uh, transformational. Leno's 